Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7111 in the name of Stephen Kerr on the state of the Scottish education system. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on uh, Stephen Kerr to speak to and to move the motion around 13 minutes, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is my privilege to move the motion in my name that speaks to what I believe to be the most important thing that we have powers over in this Parliament, Scotland's education system and the future of our children and our country. I have said before in this chamber that the gift of a Scottish education is the most prized gift that Scotland can give to her children, and our education system is central to our national identity. An education system that gives our young people confidence to move forward, that thrives on innovation, that sparks entrepreneurship, that extends equal opportunity to all, the very definition of levelling up. An educational tradition that makes us feel proud of our Scottishness, which is why, presiding officer, you should expect to hear strong words and emotion from these benches this afternoon about the way that our education system has been maltreated by the SNP. Their end of year report card reads, must do better. The Scottish Conservatives have education at the heart of our political philosophy, because education must be a golden ticket for every individual to live the life they desire to live. The equal opportunity to succeed in life is core to the Scottish Conservative vision of the Scotland we want to see. Inspirational teachers are crucial to education, and the Scottish Conservatives are standing up for Scotland's teachers. I know how much I owe my teachers. Mr Mitchell, my history teacher at Forfar Academy, who fired my enthusiasm for history. Mrs Skinner, my English teacher, who told us that if they wanted to develop any kind of a vocabulary, we should read the Times at least once a week. Sound advice indeed. We owe so much to our teachers, but we also have a responsibility to them. For the first time in 40 years, teachers are taking industrial action in Scotland. Teachers are frustrated. The teachers I speak to don't want to be on strike. They want to be in the classroom doing what they train to do and love to do, teaching our children. But they expect to be respected. They deserve to be treated fairly. And they've been waiting eight months for this Cabinet Secretary to get serious. Shirley Ann Somerville has made a total mess of this situation. She blamed the teachers, she blamed the unions, she blamed the local councils, she even blamed the UK government. The only innocent party in this dispute, according to the Cabinet Secretary, is the Cabinet Secretary herself. What should have been resolved months ago is unresolved, and the buck stops with Shirley Ann Somerville. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. He has not yet said, although he's implying that there should be a better pay increase. Now, I understand the teachers have been offered £35,000, which seems reasonable. Could he put a figure on what he wants? Stephen Kerr. I thank uh, the member for his intervention. If I was at the negotiating table, this, this dispute would have been resolved months ago. But the, cabinet, but the Cabinet Secretary, who has the responsibility to be at the negotiating table, has failed to resolve this dispute and is intent on blaming everybody else for this dispute, including the teachers themselves. I will give way. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Uh, I thank Mr Kerr uh, for taking another invention. It didn't actually um, answer the point, so if he was at the negotiating table, what would he offer and where would he take the money from in the education budget? Stephen Kerr. I think that the Cabinet Secretary may have got this the wrong way round. She comes to Parliament to be held accountable by the members of this Parliament. So I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what exactly is she doing to bring the teachers' dispute to an end? That's far more pertinent than asking me what I would do. What are you doing, Cabinet Secretary, to end this dispute? And there have been... And there have been nearly 75,000 reported incidents of violence or serious threat against teachers in the past five years, over 20,000 of them in the last academic year alone. This means there is, 
I will. Uh, Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you. In February, I raised in this chamber uh, a survey which said that nearly half of our dedicated, hard-working teachers in Aberdeen were considering quitting due to the levels of violence that he's just raised. And a fortnight ago, I raised that uh, teachers at Northfield Academy had, had, to take, had taken a decision to industrial action on the same basis. Can I ask the member, while researching today's debate, has he come across any evidence of this government doing anything as a result of my questions to help teachers in Aberdeen? Stephen Kerr. And I thank, thank my friend for his intervention, and I think he already knows the answer to that. There is no evidence of anything happening. I'll tell you what the current level of reported incidents of violence and threat amounts to. There is an incident when a teacher is attacked or threatened in Scotland every three minutes. And by the time we finish this debate, 40 such incidents will have been recorded. Teachers striking at Northfield Academy and Bannerman High School do so because they feel vulnerable, unprotected and unsupported by this SNP government. But all this Cabinet Secretary ever does is pass the buck. It is the SNP that have cut deep into the resources of local government. And it is up to the SNP to reorder their political priorities to properly fund the resolution to these disputes, to end the defunding of local government and put resources back into the classroom. With a 15.6% cut in ASN teachers since 2012, despite a 92% increase in demand, teachers are run ragged and unsupported by the specialists they need. What is the Cabinet Secretary going to do to protect and support our teachers? What is she going to do about discipline in our schools? The SNP is leaving. I won't give way. I think I've taken a number of interventions now. The SNP is leaving many newly qualified teachers without jobs. Out of nearly 1,800 probationers in 2012, only 400 had a permanent contract last year. 400 were so scunnered that they had left teaching altogether. This is a tragic waste of talent. How on earth does the Cabinet Secretary think these newly qualified teachers can get on with the rest of their lives or plan for their futures when they don't even have a permanent contract? How does this make teaching the attractive career in Scotland we all need it to be? Why isn't she banging the table to fix this problem? The SNP like to pretend that they are succeeding on attainment by focusing on the attainment gap. But writing in The Times in June, Professor Lindsay Patterson criticised the SNP's approach and showed that the marginal gains in narrowing the attainment gap were only a reflection of a fall in attainment at the top end. Not so much levelling up as levelling down. He also said that today we know less about the performance of Scotland schools than at any time since the 1950s. The SNP have taken us out of the international comparison tables on attainment. They are so reluctant to face reality that they simply don't measure it. So, Cabinet Secretary, today, will you commit to putting Scotland back into those international comparators so we can learn how we are doing for our young people and our children? The First Minister said her neck was on the line. Education was her sacred responsibility. Well, it's a shame that she didn't even bother to turn up this afternoon for our debate on education, which is rare enough in this parliamentary timetable. But it's really, it's really no wonder what little data we have illustrates just how much the SNP are failing. Fewer people, pupils at primary school are achieving the expected curriculum for excellence level in reading, writing, numeracy, listening, talking than in 2018. That is pretty much every subject area at a primary school. This, presiding officer, is not a debating point or a matter to cover up or evade by dissimulation. It is a national disgrace and it is a scandal. Will the Cabinet Secretary tell us what she will do to address overall attainment in our schools made worse by her governments in action. And we face another critical challenge, and that is in the availability of subject choice across all parts of Scotland. 
We are falling behind in science, technology, in engineering, and in maths. The uptake in these subjects is at a five-year low, and there is a dramatic fall in the number of pupils studying modern languages, especially French, German, and Spanish, compared with other parts of the United Kingdom. So will the Cabinet Secretary tell us what is being done to recruit teachers in STEM subjects and modern languages? What is being done to promote and facilitate subject choice? What is being done to attract more pupils into those subject areas? Now, the First Minister decreed that Education Scotland and the SQA are to be scrapped. No one I've ever spoken to or listened to in those organisations seemed to be prepared to accept that they had failed at all, least of all the leadership of those bodies. So surprise, surprise, it's those very self-same people who are now designing the new system. Only the SNP could create such a Lilliputian scenario. I will give way. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful to the member to give way. Would you not also agree with me that it was disappointing the Scottish Government's announcement last week that the new body would retain um, the um, awarding and regulation of qualifications? Where is the change? Where is the hope for a better future? Stephen Kerr. I am grateful to the member for his intervention. It is further evidence that this Government and this Cabinet Secretary do not listen because all of the advice is to the contrary of what the government announced last week. I think what the cabinet secretary needs to understand is that being seen to do something is not the same as doing something. It just isn't. So I ask again, why are there 59 people on the reform delivery bodies, predominantly from the Scottish Government, Education Scotland and the SQA, and why are there only three places for teachers? And why does this all sound vaguely familiar as a game of musical chairs? Why is she so afraid of new voices and thinking in education reform? Did she even look at getting new people in? Presiding officer, I conclude. Scotland needs teachers who are confident, held in high esteem, and who are free to teach. Scotland needs head teachers who are free to lead their schools. Scotland needs pupils free to learn without disruption in the classroom. Scotland needs schools that inspire and uplift our young people to be all that they can be in life. If we get those principles right, we will succeed in vitalising our education system. But when she stands to speak, I hope we might see a cabinet secretary with some passion, some reforming zeal, who will deliver an articulate vision of what Scottish education should be that goes beyond the normal SNP complacency and self-congratulation. Let's hear answers to the serious questions I have raised in my speech. Acknowledge the real challenges we face, and then let us work together across this parliament to tackle them together. I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. I now call on Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and to move Amendment 7111.3. Around nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Uh, Scotland's learners, parents, carers and everyone who works in education have been through an extraordinary period over the past few years. They deserve our thanks, our admiration for everything they have achieved against the challenging backdrop of the COVID pandemic, the drive for recovery and now, of course, the cost of living crisis. Notwithstanding the significant challenges to our education system, I see first-hand examples, day in and day out, of teachers, childcare practitioners and lecturers going the extra mile to support our children and young people and adult learners in their learner journey to ensure that they thrive and achieve positive destinations. Scottish education is performing well and is continually improving thanks to the hard work and the dedication of the education workforce. Teacher numbers are at their highest since uh, since 2008, with the number of primary teachers the highest since 1980. The pupil-teacher ratio is the best on record, and we have the highest spending per pupil within the UK nations. The latest figures show that more school leavers in Scotland are in education, employment or training nine months after the end of the school year. That's 93.2% in 2021. Progress is being made in closing the attainment gap, and outcomes are improving. 
Scotland is the only part of the United Kingdom to offer the equivalent of 1140 hours of high quality early learning and childcare to all eligible children, regardless of their parents' working status, putting children first. Internationally, Scottish education is viewed as high performing by the OECD, who recently reviewed and endorsed the curriculum for excellence. And indeed, the 2018 PISA study ranked Scotland amongst the top performing countries in young people's global competence. And of course, Scotland leads the EU with the highest proportion of adults aged 25 to 64 continuing in their education. Michael Mara. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary giving way. On the PISA figures, does she not recognise that there is a long-term trend of decline on issues of literacy and numeracy in our schools? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do recognise we continue to strive to do better in literacy and numeracy, and I think we will obviously have information that's coming out next week on the ASL statistics about how we have dealt with, as a system, uh, the challenge of COVID and how we are moving to recover out of COVID. So while, of course, there is uh, more that we need to do in this area, particularly because of the COVID pandemic, I hope that we will see improvement next week. But of course, we will need to wait for the statistics to come out to see whether indeed that is the case. But we know we can and must do better. And that's why I have embarked on a wide ranging and an ambitious programme of reform. Because even though we start with strong foundations, I know there is no room for complacency if Scottish education is to improve and to adapt to the challenges ahead. The world around us has changed beyond recognition over the last few years, and our learners and those who support them deserve a system that's flexible enough to suit their needs. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary giving way. And on that point, does she not see the con contention that people have over the announcement last week that the new exam body will both award and regulate qualifications? Where is the improvement in that decision? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the important reason behind that point was the, the actual recommendation that Ken Muir put forward. I did see uh, the, the, the point of and where he was coming from. But what you have to recognise is actually the accreditation would have moved effectively in government and been delivered by civil servants. Now, accreditation has to be independent of government. And actually, when we looked at the details of that, it would have lost some of the independence it has. So my challenge to everybody in the chamber as we move forward in this is how can we make it more independent from government? How can we actually take on the challenge which Ken Muir gave us but I unfortunately would respectfully say in a different way, because we would have lost that independence if it had actually moved to within the new agency, as had been recommended in the initial report. But can I move on? Uh, I'd like to just make a little bit of progress, if Mr Rennie would forgive me. Um, on to the national discussion. Alongside COSLA, I've co-convened a national discussion on the vision for Scottish education, which provides an opportunity for everyone who is passionate about education to shake that in a consensual vision for the future. And I hope Mr Kerr took the opportunity eh, to take part in that national um, discussion. I don't know whether he took up that invitation that it was made to party spokespeople or not. I have been humbled by the number of children, young people and early learning and childcare practitioners, the teachers, the lecturers, support staff, parents, carers and others who have taken the time eh, to consider what they value about education and to give their views. More than 5,400 responses have been received and 26,000 young people took part in online school assemblies, ensuring that the voices of learners will be at the heart of this reform. So that national discussion is the biggest listening exercise that's ever taken place in education. But listening is not just the first step and if we are truly to meet the needs and the aspirations of our learners, we need to build consensus for change. So while the national discussion will provide a long-term compelling vision for education, it's supporting that we start with immediate work towards that vision. So that's why, when it's published next year, the vision will be accompanied by calls to action, setting out short, medium and long-term activity to start bringing that vision to life. Now, as announced in October last year, of course, Professor Louise Hayward is leading an independent review of qualifications and assessments to ensure our reports remains fit for purpose and to guarantee the best educational experience for learners. Understanding the views of everyone in the system will be vital in shaping the future of our approach to qualifications and assessments, and Professor Hayward is engaging widely in a public consultation is currently underway. That's a very important exercise, and I hope as many people as possible will share their views. Professor Hayward will also 
consider carefully the views and ideas which, of course, emerge from the national discussion and will incorporate those alongside her work into a final report, which I am looking forward to receiving next year. <clears throat> and the reform of our national bodies will ensure that our education system supports learners to thrive, providing them with the best opportunities to succeed. So we're establishing three new national education bodies and work is underway to design how those bodies will be structured. It's vital that new national bodies reflect and deliver change in how our education system supports education staff and children and young people. So the independent expectorate will be able to provide all of those with a stake in education, including parliament and ministers, with objective assessments and analysis on the strength of our system and opportunities for further improvement, which draws on a sufficient baseline of inspections. Stephen Kerr. Uh, yeah. Grateful to the Council for giving way, but does she accept the criticism that is levied at those who are piloting the, the, the reform bodies, that this is the same crew that were in these key positions in Education Scotland, the SQA and other bodies, Scottish Government. Where are the new voices? Where are the new ideas? And I recognise that you're seven, that the Secretary is seven minutes into her speech and still hasn't mentioned the pressing issue of the teachers' dispute. Government Secretary. Very clear on numerous occasions to Parliament uh, my position on the teachers' dispute in that the last offer, the fourth offer that was put to teachers was uh, a, a fair and an affordable one. Uh, the 10 per cent ask from teaching unions is unaffordable and Mr Kerr had the opportunity to suggest um, how uh, the Conservatives would like to move forward with that and he, funnily enough, had absolutely nothing to say on the matter, presiding officer. But in terms of the national bodies, I will make the decisions about what happens in the reform process. I am determined to move forward with that reform process. And of course, when we look at the target operating models that will be developed, these will be available for consultation to everyone before I make the final uh, decisions on these matters. So, of course, we will see, for example, a more accountable, more representative government structure within the new public body responsible for education. We will, of course, see a new agency for education uh, that will be to do with what teachers want rather than all the time what government wants. That's an important change that we will make in all of that. And of course, we also have the consultation on our shared framework on the inspection of early learning and school aged childcare settings that will be due imminently. And we have the work on the pur purpose and principles for post school education as well. This, accompanied with the independent review of schools' delivery landscape, is a package of reform built around the national discussion that will ensure that we have a reform package to ensure our education system is fit for purpose and fit for the futures. Most importantly, having learners at the heart of that. And I sincerely hope that members across the chamber, particularly from the political parties that are taking part in this debate today, took part in that national discussion. They were all invited to. They were all invited along to meet our co-facilitators to be able to take part in the consensual way that we could deliver policy together. I certainly hope they took part in that opportunity. This is an ideal time to get involved and seize rather than making statements to Parliament alone. We could work together in the national discussion and I hope they did so. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Michael Mara to speak to and to move Amendment 7111.1. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Today we are debating Scottish education with schools across Scotland closed as part of the first ongoing national teaching strike in 40 years. And that disruption and loss of learning is landing on a generation that has already lost so much in the pandemic. And the real impact of which the government continues to refuse to quantify and for which a new response is deemed unworthy of countenance. And strike action is uh, certainly Cabinet Secretary. Would he agree that the actual ASO statistics, which will be published next week, and the work around the health and wellbeing census actually allows us to look at what's happened and to see what action needs to be taken on that? Michael Mara. I would say, obviously, I haven't seen those statistics. I'm sure if, if the Cabinet Secretary wanted to talk about them in any detail, she could have brought them with her to Parliament today. And I would, I would, I would, I would, well, maybe she, maybe she hasn't seen them. So let's wait and see what, what it says. And we'll, I hope there'll be a statement on those statistics when they're produced. And we can have the debate in Parliament as a result of if she's promising that discussion should be happening. And first, uh, Mr. Mr. Officer, Mr. Mark, uh, can I just, please? I'm having three different conversations go on, which is too, too many. Mr. Mayor, please resume. Thank you, President Officer. Strike action is 
a failure on the part of this government, and their public pay plans and industrial relations are pitiful. They are characterised by bad faith and a lack of professionalism, illustrated by what was quite literally a last-minute offer. Emailed to the EIS at 4.29pm when their pay committee was meeting at 4.30pm. And that offer had sat on the Cabinet Secretary's desk for three and a half weeks. Nobody on these benches dismisses the challenges of meeting public sector pay demands with inflation running at horrendous levels due to the grotesque economic incompetence of the Conservative Government. But what we should all expect are those challenging negotiations, I understand they are challenging, to be conducted professionally and in good faith. The Cabinet Secretary knows that a fair deal will have to be done, and the sooner that happens, the better for pupils across Scotland. And the warm words in the Government amendment today about our teachers are not borne out in these actions, just as the list of working groups and reviews do not add up to a proper education policy that can transform the lives of our children and build the stronger Scotland that we need for the decades ahead. And for each budget cycle, we're in the depths of one right now, this Cabinet Secretary and her ministers comprehensively lose the argument for education inside this sclerotic government. Cuts to school budgets, cuts to colleges, cuts to universities, and they comprehensively fail the test of leadership too. Colleges are crying out for a decision of any kind whatsoever as to what they should be doing. What do they get? A coherence review, to be followed by a statement of intent, to inform a purpose and principles plan. All impenetrable babble. So what does it actually mean? I'll translate, presiding officer. It means the government does not have a clue what it is doing. And that's illustrated by a skills review lauded in the amendment that the government have lodged today that I would remind the chamber is only happening because Audit Scotland were utterly damning of a lack of any ministerial direction whatsoever. They don't have a clue what they want to achieve. And the core STEM subjects that will provide the bedrock of any future prosperity are in long-term decline, with dropping teacher numbers, dropping number of students and dropping levels of attainment. It is urgent and it is happening now. Where is the response? Filed, unfortunately, under too difficult. So it's a government without a vision or a purpose for education in Scotland. And it's little wonder then that the reform programme we have been discussing for our national education bodies is collapsing into the rebranding exercise that we always suspected it would be. That process has been run by the managers of the existing Education Scotland and the Inspector and, of course, the SQA. Maybe the Cabinet Secretary does not hear the young people of Scotland. And I have been involved in that national conversation on a day-to-day -day basis, visiting schools, speaking to teachers, speaking to pupils, and engaging with them in this parliament each time that is a possibility is there. And I can tell the Cabinet Secretary just how angry those people, or young people are about what happened to them over the pandemic. Not just the ones whose appeals for excep exceptional circumstances the Cabinet Secretary chucked in the bin, but how they were all betrayed by their qualifications agency and by the incompetence of a Deputy First Minister who lurched out of one mess and right into the next, time and time again. Ken Muir was absolutely clear in his report, which we all said we would honour, that public faith in the qualifications agency was of the utmost importance, presiding officer, that people must have confidence in that process, the outcomes and the certificates that should be a passport to a better life. With any currency, as Liz Trust learned to all of our costs, confidence is everything. Ken Muir's key recommendation to rebuild confidence was to separate out regulation and accreditation from the awarding body. So the reaction of the Cabinet Secretary further laid out today is scarcely believable. Under pressure from the managers who are calling the shots, she bends to their will and refuses to take the key decision, backing the status quo and more of the same. What that betrays, I will in one second, what that betrays is the same lack of understanding of what has happened that was displayed by our predecessor because they got it wrong and they got it all wrong year after year in the pandemic. Yes, sir. Stephen Kerr. I'm astonished, um, as I'm sure other members will be, at the lacklustre speech that we heard from the Cabinet Secretary. Does Michael Maher agree with me that she seems to be a prisoner of the worst side of the Scottish educational establishment? 
Michael Mara. What I can say is that there's a real need for change. And we have to understand, uh, Mr Kerr, and I think everybody, everyone that looks at this in good conscience would understand, is the reform process we're in cannot be a cosmetic fix. It can't be new logos on the business cards above the same old names on the business cards below. And we can't allow the new qualifications body to mark its own homework. The change must be real. And the change could not be more needed. Despite calls from the Education Committee in this Parliament, there is no proper government assessment of the impact of the pandemic. Yet we see the consequences everywhere. Key groups, P3 and P4, S2 and S3, groups of young people adrift and teaching staff struggling to cope. Riots in Kirkton, Dundee, Nidre in Edinburgh and disruption across Scotland. Police saying that a cohort of kids, and the police directly saying this, have lost years of structure and community, love and care due to lockdown and isolation. And what do we get? No response, no concerted response, no support for our schools or colleges, not a word. Where is the plan? We have attendance down, presiding officer, across the country. Where is the plan to re-engage? East Lothian Council have started a programme with Edinburgh College to work intensively with families. Where is the national response? Presiding officer, in conclusion, the future of this country depends on the decisions that these ministers make. The greatest economic levers available anywhere are in their hands. We have a small window to make good the harm of the pandemic, but that window is closing. Thank you, Mr Mara. I now call uh, Willie Rennie. Around six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. The poverty-related attainment gap is wide as ever. Hundreds of teachers on zero-hours contracts for years on end, even more leaving the profession forever. An exodus of staff from private and voluntary nurseries because of government-directed inequality of funding, violent attacks on teachers, a decline in pupils taking STEM exams, big shortfalls in STEM teacher training recruitment, Scottish universities more dependent than ever on tuition fees from international students, despite the vulnerability that comes with global turbulence. Scottish universities losing hundreds of millions of pounds of UK research funding. The Skills Landscape Review still being reviewed five years on. The Higher Education Minister criticised by Audit Scotland for a lack of leadership on skills. Colleges that still don't know what government wants them to do. Thatcherite national testing and league tables ignored by the teachers, ignoring the Greens and ignoring this very Parliament. On that, the SNP still haven't learnt that you don't fatten a pig by measuring it. A Covid exams debacle that undermined the judgement of teachers and condemned poorer pupils. Pupil equity funding used to pay the police. An under-resourced reform of additional needs. Keeping the SQA and Education Scotland in all but name. They will now even share the very same offices. To top it all, teachers on strike on pay for the first time for 40 years. The last time was when the Conservatives ran Scottish education four decades ago. It was that long ago even I was at school the last time we had a strike. The SNP are bereft of ideas. They are bereft. And the vision today that the Education Secretary set out was a rosy picture. But it was so far removed from reality and the daily experience of teachers and pupils in this country. All of this since Nicola Sturgeon made education her defining mission. Once the pride of the nation, highly regarded across the globe, in the last 15 years, slipping down the international league tables, now the First Minister has made it a whole lot worse. The flagship education bill was ditched, replaced by a basket of contradictory and knee-jerk measures. She put her most senior ally in charge of education. Now John Swinney is back at his old job. It was her number one priority. Now Nicola Sturgeon hardly even talks about it. It's a terrible record. But it's not the Scottish ministers who have lost out. It's a generation of young people who have lost out, and they should be ashamed of this record. Now, members know I like to be positive. We, we need an alternative approach 
to this miserable performance by our SNP government. So what to do? We must start by valuing teachers with decent pay, better working conditions and trusting their judgment with a new Macron agreement, the one which reformed the profession under the last Labour Liberal Democrat leadership. Just briefly, yes. Um, Bob Doris. I thank the member for giving me. He's mentioned several times about the professional judgment of teachers. We're looking at a new national qualifications framework for attainment. How much do you think we should move away from exit exams and how much towards more accreditation from teachers when we look at that balance? Because that would be a positive and constructive contribution to make to this debate on education rather than just sound bites. Willie Rennie. It's hardly a sound bite to set out the atrocious record of the member's government. And he should be ashamed that he's a, he supports this government day in, day out. But I want to enter this debate, and I'm listening very carefully to the approach that's been taken. I think there are some innovative ways that we can, we can change the way that we have the exams and the qualifications and the years at which we take them. That requires decent consideration, but it's, it's not a replacement for a proper strategy on the wider responsibilities of this government towards education. I think we need to make the curriculum work with specialist advice and support for classroom teachers that has been absent for years since the Curriculum for Excellence was established. And we must abolish national testing and reform the exams and qualifications so that they match the curriculum. We must elevate the prestige of vocational qualifications. Despite trying for decades to do so, we need to learn the lessons from Germany in those reforms. Reform the age at which children begin formal education at school, in line with SNP policy. I seem to support SNP policy on this more than the SNP government does. Create a new national independent education bodies that have the trust of teachers because they are led by teachers following the recommendations of the Muir, the Muir Review. My colleague Beatrice Wishart would want government to explore making swimming a key part of the curriculum, just like they have in England. That is something that is incredibly important for our young people. Give clarity for colleges with an urgent statement of intent, including their central role in training and retraining for the new sustainable economy. Hold a national review of our universities to set long-term sustainable approach. Create the new Scottish Erasmus without any further delay following the Taith Welsh model, which is already up and running, offering opportunities for young people. Create the reform, the funding for early years to ensure all staff are paid fair and equal wages, no matter their employer. These are all positive proposals for our future. Liberal Democrats believe so much in education. It is the great leveller. It is the opportunity provider. It is the economic driver and the society maker. That is why we need a government. We need a government that prioritises education rather than the miserable record that we've had over the last 15 years. Let's have a change, a new vision and a new leadership. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr Rennie. Uh, we will now move to the uh, open debate. Uh, Backbench speeches of six minutes. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Cocab Stewart. Uh, thank you. When parents send their children to school, I think they want three things. Firstly, that their children are able to read, write and count properly and don't let anybody tell me that that is old fashioned. They want good quality discipline and they want a well-rounded education both inside and outside the classroom. And all that, of course, is dependent on good quality teaching. Presiding officer, I don't think any of that is too much to ask. And so when Nicola Sturgeon told education, education leaders on the 19th of August 2015 that education was her number one priority, I agreed with her. Even more so when six months later she reiterated that commitment and she told us that there would be a new education bill forthcoming promising greater devolution to schools. Maybe, just maybe, the collective findings of the Donaldson, McCormack, Cameron and Bloomer reports into Scottish school education, all carried out by experts in their fields between 2011 and 2016, were beginning to sink in. Namely, that Scottish education, despite all the things on which it could pride itself, needed to be shaken out of its complacency and moved on. 
Incidentally, exactly the same was said by Howie two decades before. Of course, these reports appeared at the very same, very same time that the OECD, the Scottish Survey of Attainment, PISA, Reform Scotland, the Scottish Government's own statistics, all produced compelling evidence that Scotland was flatlining when it came to attainment. And worse still, that the attainment gap between rich and poor was widening, thereby disadvantaging large numbers of young people, something which had always been fundamentally at odds with the basic principles of good Scottish education, once renowned across the world. And let's be clear that the principles of that Scottish education articulated very well with the curriculum for excellence as set out by Peter Peacock. I was even more encouraged when in 2017, the programme for government, it proclaimed, and I quote, a new education bill will deliver the biggest and most radical change to how our schools are run. Yes. Nicola Sturgeon even went as far in the Scotland on Sunday article to say that the London model of cluster schools was worth looking at because it was delivering good results for more disadvantaged pupils. And John Swinney, when reflecting on the poor performance of one particular local authority, told us, and I quote again, the status quo was not an option. So what on earth went wrong in the SNP High Command? Why, after the successive tenures of Fiona Hislop, Mike Russell, Angela Constance, John Swinney, and now Shirley Ann Somerville, are we failing to deliver better outcomes after all the professional advice that we have received? For me, it comes down mainly to three things. Firstly, that teachers have been sufficiently undervalued as key professionals. And Graham Donaldson at the time had very interesting things to say about that, particularly as he said that too many teachers were reporting that they felt uncomfortable with regard to some gaps in their professional training. And of course, it doesn't help when we see the soaring number of cases of verbal and physical assaults, as mentioned by Stephen Kerr. Secondly, the Scottish Government has shown an extraordinary unwillingness to properly reform the agencies in education. Not just rebadge them, Michael Mara made some excellent points about this, or move the deck chairs round a bit, but properly reform them to reflect the support that is available to teachers. Because no one can argue that Education Scotland and the SQA have had a happy history in recent times. Indeed, when I was on the Education Committee of this Parliament for a very substantial number of years, hardly a term went past without the Committee's attention being drawn to significant problems within the agencies. Problems that meant that teachers felt remote and frustrated by these education agencies. And that can never be a blueprint for a successful education system. And thirdly, I want to mention the lack of rigour because it comes back to the structure and the delivery of the curriculum. Back in 1992, Professor John Howey reflected on the abiding strength of the breadth of Scottish education in relation to England, but he also wanted to see a European-style baccalaureate which introduced much more depth and rigour in assessment of the Scottish system. We should have listened more to what he said. And the Scottish Government, through Mike Russell, attempted a Scottish baccalaureate, but that never took off because of the weak structure and the poor uptake of Scottish pupils. And part of that issue has manifested itself in the problems over subject choice, which was debated so many times in the previous parliaments on the back of the work of Professor Jim Scott. And in one of these debates, John Swinney told me that if we counted up the subjects that are on offer in Scottish schools, we would actually have more of them now than we had before. Well, he's right if he uses that accounting method, but he couldn't deny that the subjects for arts, for social sciences and for science have been very badly squeezed, bringing about further difficulties in the curriculum. And it's all very well having good skills, they're important, but if you don't actually know things as well, then these skills aren't much use. Presiding officer, there is no getting away from the fact that both the quantitative and qualitative evidence tells that Scottish schools are stuck in a rut when it comes to raising attainment across the board. That has been happening across the board on the SNP's watch for a very long time. And the longer that that, rust, uh, that, that rut persists, then there is a fundamental problem in taking this forward. Far too many children remain functionally illiterate, which is a major concern to employers. And that is despite more public spending per head of people. So it's not about the money, it's about the system. 
we have a huge opportunity to get our education system right. We need a vision of Scottish education in an all-round capacity, a vision that will not just suit the economy, but one which promotes a fair-minded, ethical society in which individuals are valued for who they are, both pupils and teachers alike. We need an education system in which every individual is encouraged to reach for the stars with schools of ambition and where every step of the way we are promoting excellence rather than the lowest common denominator, which far too often is the trademark of education policy. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I would remind members that uh, speeches are up to six minutes. I call Co-Cab Stewart to be followed by Alec Riley. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I always welcome the opportunity to debate Scottish education in a constructive spirit, uh, but I must begin today by reflecting on the unremitting negative approach of this motion from the Tories. Um, there is such a lack of acknowledgement of the excellent work done by teachers and the incredible achievements of pupils around the country or the international standing of our further and higher education institutions. One must assume that the goal of such a motion as this is not to improve but to undermine, not to support and sustain but to insult and injure. Um, and I'd like to quote uh, Mr Kerr. Uh, as recently as the 7th of November, Stephen Kerr said in this very chamber, and I quote, that we have one of the best educated populations in the world. He went on to say, we have always been at the forefront of innovation and development. Surely that is a result of Scottish Government policy. So looking at the tone, amongst other things, looking at the tone of Mr Kerr's motion, I can say that I'm not angry about it, but I am very, very disappointed. Education in Scotland, I'm going to crack on for a little bit. Education in Scotland and the UK is facing huge challenges. Challenges that have been made worse by soaring inequalities and continuing effect of the pandemic, the appalling state of the UK economy and the devastating effect of inflation on Scottish Government budgets. Now, no government can or should evade responsibility for delivering for its citizens. But to ignore the context that government is operating in um, or the success that is being achieved in the face of it is to me unacceptable. Now, the OECD values Scottish education system highly, describing the curriculum for excellence as a holistic, coherent, future-orientated approach to learning. And other countries are adopting this style um, and approach because of the value that it delivers. And we must also remember that exam pass rates across the board have increased this year compared with the last year's exam diets of uh, 2019, including A-grade passes. Skills-based qualifications are close to the highest ever figure. Positive destinations of school leavers stand at 93.2%. And nine out of 10 head teachers agree that improvements have been made in closing the poverty-related attainment gap, despite the impact of the pandemic. I will give way. Michael Murray. I thank the member for giving way. And she, she rightly cites the, the, the challenges of the pandemic, to which I don't believe there's been any kind of key in response from the government, but would she recognise that the long-term decline in PISA outcomes for reading, mathematics and science that Scotland has faced under this government for a decade? Co-Cap Stewart. I would recognise that the poverty-related attainment gap is incredibly stubborn and it requires um, measures that look at poverty as a whole, looking at social policy and health policy, working with education. Now, I make no apology for listing policies that the Scottish Government has implemented to mitigate the effects of Tory austerity on education. I will continue. Attainment challenge funding of over a billion pounds over this Parliament, 1140 hours of quality early learning and childcare, rolling out digital devices for every school child, expanding free school meal provision, increasing school clothing grants and investing in the school estate. 
On the day this year's exam results were published, I read a tweet from my colleague Michael Mara, who wrote, Congratulations to all young people receiving results today. Whether celebrating or slightly down at heart, please know that there are endless possibilities out there for you. He went on then to say, Your achievements are also masking real problems in our education system. Now, I would suggest that young people's achievements, far from masking problems, reflect their own efforts, the quality of our education system and all those who work within it. And I would further suggest, in response to Mr Mara, that the endless possibilities he refers to reflect the Scottish Government's commitment to make higher education free for young people, to support our colleges sector, to deliver foundation and modern apprenticeships. I will give way. I, I appreciate, appreciate the Mr. member Mara. giving way. Does you not recognise then that actually the young people who are making those, uh, achieving those uh, qualifications do so in the context of a decline in the number of teaching number, uh, teachers under this government, uh, a, a compression in the number of subjects that they can choose in their schools, and the, uh, the huge impact that the pandemic is having over that period as well. That is the context I was talking about and the challenge in Scottish education policy to which this government refuses to rise. That was quite a long intervention, co cap Stuart. Well, that we have the highest level of teachers that we have had for many years, since, since at least 2019, I believe. Now, in turning to higher and further education sector, I'm going to carry on. <laughs> um, presiding officer, I will continue in the face of uh, hearing. Mr. Uh, on the basis that the previous speaker was 45 seconds over, I will give you the same courtesy. So you have 45 extra seconds. Thank you. I am very grateful for, for that, presiding officer. In 2020, the University of Glasgow was named the Times Higher Education University of the Year. It is currently in the top 100 in both the Times Higher Education and Quackerelli Simmons uh, rankings, world rankings. This year, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, also in my constituency, was also ranked as one of the world's top destinations to study the performing arts on the similar rankings. It came fifth out of 15,000 university programmes at over uh, 1,500 universities. Also, the City of College Glasgow has retained its STEM assured status for the next three years, having once again met and exceeded the UK STEM Foundation's rigorous accreditation criteria. Now, having started at the chalk M phase Ms. Stewart, myself, I think you need to bring your remarks Thank to you, close, presiding please. officer. Um, I just wanted to, didn't want to finish without pointing out the fact that I do sympathise with teaching unions in their pursuit of a pay claim, and I know that nobody wants to strike, and I do urge all parties to work to find a compromise that is sustainable and fair. Now, in conclusion, well, I, mean, um, really, I offer the Ms. Scottish Stewart, Government... I think I've really been very generous, so please, uh, you really need to conclude now. Thank you very Thank much you, indeed. Thank you, presiding officer. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Graeme Day. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Rowley. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate as I have been raising issues around our current approach to education regularly, uh, not least with regards to the education recovery from the impact of COVID through my work on the COVID-19 committee. Now, we are in Scotland governed by two governments. The Scottish Government have direct responsibility for education, and I'll come on to that. But we also have a government in Westminster that has in the main direct responsibility for the economy. So reading the motion that has been brought forward by the Tories, I firstly must say I'm surprised that they brought this forward without at least acknowledging the impact of failed Tory austerity on education. And indeed the current crisis in the economy made in Downing Street, but wreaking havoc on public services, including education. Liz Smith said it's not about the money. I respectfully disagree. And if you see the briefing that came out for COSLA today, they are very clear what the detrimental impacts will be, will be on education if the cuts to, that are currently being proposed go ahead. Liz Smith. Uh, Liz Smith. I would ask the member, though, if, if the continuous extra spending per head of pupil has always been going up, why is it? It's not all about the money, that we're not imp improving the attainment level. Alec Riley. We've seen, for example, and I will come on to it in terms of class sizes, I did an FOI in five uh, last year, I think it was, and the number of, the number of children in class 
classes that were way over. So Fife Council showed that local schools have 400, this is in Fife, 412 primary classes of over 25, 136 primary class classes with over 30 children. I know when my, my, my granddaughter was in primary school and was struggling with maths and we spoke to the teacher about it, she said the class has 32 children in it. I'm sorry, I just do not have the time to put off. The EIS have been calling for years to cut class sizes and they're right to do so, but that would cost a fair bit of money. And at a time when Tory hysteria and further Tory austerity that we're now facing because you, because you tank the economy, then, then you do have a bit of a nerve to come here and, and point the finger at one government when both governments clearly are responsible and the level of cuts that have taken place. Now, for the SNP, it is a fact that over, over the austerity years, you disproportionately cut the amount of funding going into local authorities. And given about 50% of the local authority budget goes on education, it's highly, hardly surprising that cuts have taken place. I know when I was leader of Fife Council, there was cut after cut taking place in local government as a direct result of the cuts that we were facing from this government uh, being passed on for the Tories. Yep. Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the, the opportunity to, to just give some statistics about local government financial stats that show that local government authorities spent £6.4 billion on education in Scotland in 2021, and that was up from £6 billion in 2019-20. That's a 6.8 per cent increase in cash terms. Alec Riley. It's, it's, about, it's about having ambition to actually improve education. I really believe that education in Scotland is going backwards. I can see it firsthand for, for the communities that I represent and for the Cabinet Secretary to shake her head and not acknowledge that's the case. The number of children that are going through the whole primary school system, then going into secondary school, lacking the basic skills in numeracy and literacy means that they've been let down at that point and they're deemed to fail every step of the way through their education system and come out the other side not prepared for the world they work and having to take low paid, low skilled jobs. So, so I do believe that the Cabinet Secretary and our amendment here today does not acknowledge that. I would say that in terms of teachers, in terms of the strike, you have to, go, you have to address that. You asked the question earlier, how would you pay for that? Well, that's about priorities. This government chose to prioritise other things over local government funding in the past. So you need, we cannot continue with the strikes that are damaging education for children in Scotland that have already been damaged by the, the, the effects of COVID. It is your responsibility to find a solution to that, Cabinet Secretary, and you cannot run away from that responsibility. Our children need to be in schools getting education, and it is your role to address that and ensure that you do so. In terms of STEM, which I have also raised with the Cabinet Secretary now on a number of occasions, in 2011-12, the number of pupils at higher level, achieving higher level in mathematics was 24.1 per cent. It fell to 22.6 per cent in 1819. Similarly, biology fell to 10 per cent for 12. Chemistry for 13 per cent down to 12 and so on and so forth, geography, etc. So in STEM subjects, we have to acknowledge that there's a failure. That's not to come along here and try and criticise. It's to say, if you've got a problem, you have to understand what that problem is in order to fix that problem. I'm saying to you, Cabinet Secretary, we have a problem in Scottish education. We need to address it. And simply self-praise will not achieve that. Acknowledge the difficulties, work with other parties, and let's get these problems solved. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I now call on Graeme Day to be followed by Brian Whittle. Up to six minutes, please, Mr uh, Thank you, President Officer. Um, in preparing to contribute to, to the debate, I was slightly tempted to opt for a lazy cut-and-paste approach, because it's not so long ago, 69 days ago to be precise, that we last debated education here in this chamber. So much for education debates being a rarity here, by the way. And when I read through the Conservative motion, it felt like, genuinely felt like Groundhog Day as it bore very considerable similarity to Stephen Kerr's opening speech at the end, 
of September. In contributing to that debate, I, I praise the approach being taken by the Education Committee as a genuine cross-party endeavour to interrogate the condition of our education system in a balanced way, giving credit where it is due and criticism where and when it is merited. And I bemoan the lack of a similar approach being adopted here in the Chamber itself, where, regrettably, oppositional politics overtakes offering measured and balanced analysis. Though, let me acknowledge that uh, Alec Rowley's contribution stands in contrast to that. Um, as I said then, and repeat now, presiding officer, on education, as in other things, the Scottish Government isn't perfect. And yes, sometimes we on these benches need to acknowledge that. The Cabinet Secretary herself uh, acknowledged the need for improvement, but nor is a motion like this one before us warranted. And by treating education as a political football, we as politicians not only let down those seeking the best from it, be they parents, pupils or professionals. Interestingly, my contribution back in September secured a ringing endorsement from none other than my good friend Stephen Kerr. He said, and I quote, I completely take on board the message that he, that's me, imparted in his speech. Well, that Demacian conversion to adopting a considered reasoned approach didn't last long, did it? Because here we are, less than 10 weeks on, and we're debating a motion which reads like a rant. Of course, President Officer, I, I say, President Officer, this is all in marked contrast to the positivity that I pick up when I'm visiting schools across my constituency. Of course things aren't perfect in education. There are challenges to be faced, changes needed to be made. But there's so much to celebrate in our education system, of course. Stephen Kerr. Graham Day is making a fair point, as usual. He's making a fair point. But in my speech today, I laid out what the problems were, asked, I think, reasonable questions, serious questions about serious issues, and ended with a call for us to unite to work together, but it depends on, but it depends on the basis of the government's willingness to accept there are challenges and problems that we should work on. What we get continually is nothing but self-congratulation. Graham, Graham Day, Graham right Day. Environment for a debate in this chamber. Well, if if that's how Stephen Kerr interprets his contribution today, he is no loss to the diplomatic corps. That's for sure. <laughs> As I said, there's so much to celebrate in our education system. I've, I've visited a large number of schools in my constituency uh, over the last uh, few months, and, and, and the, the whole spirit and the ethos in the school is in such marked contrast to the depressingly negative conservative motions. And, and I want to focus on something else, uh, Sign Officer. Uh, we hear all this negativity today, but let's, let's look at something else. When the SNP came to power in 2007, just 61.6% .6 of Scotland schools were in good or satisfactory condition. The most recently available figures show that the number has risen to 91.7. That's a fact. In Angus, the number is 94%. Now, I think we would all agree good quality teaching environments for our kids and our teachers are really important. I've seen enormous progress in my constituency. And in fact, for for Academy, Stephen Kerr's old school, which serves some of my Sidlock constituents, now is a brand new community campus. And at long last, we're, we're in the planning process to give money fee the state-of-the-art secondary school it deserves. Now, now, let's be clear, the credit for these advances does not rest with the SNP government alone. These bills and others before them were delivered in partnership with local authority administrations of various political colours. So I, but I say to the opposition, if we're going to criticise this government's record in education, then at least do so by recognising at the same time the success stories, which include bringing up to an acceptable standard in excess of 1,000 schools on the SNP's watch. And let's also recognise that just as credit for these advances is jointly due to government and local councils, so the responsibility for the delivery of school education, and with that accompanying credit or criticism, is surely to be shared too. The government may set their strategic agenda, but it's local education departments and, of course, individual schools which deliver. And if schools and councils are rightly praised for positive exam performance, for example, then it surely follows that responsibility, at least in part, when things aren't going so well, also lies at their door. And I would contend that's specifically the case when it comes to the very important issue of threats and violence directed at teachers, and specifically the reporting of these. The President Officer, whilst my contribution has largely been schools focused, um, I recognise there is, of course, a bigger picture. And I'm pleased to serve on the Education Committee of this Parliament, which, in addition to the work it's done over recent months on considering progress around the attainment challenge, has been looking at challenges facing universities and colleges. And I suspect there will be future opportunities to explore these topics in this chamber. And I look forward to that. 
And I hope that we can do so in a measured and balanced way, setting aside the theatre which too often overshadows genuine interrogation of matters here. In conclusion, President Officer, I say this to the Opposition. The criticisms of the performance of this Government on aspects of education would be more credible if they could occasionally bring themselves to acknowledge the many positive achievements in this regard. And their demands for money for education in all its guises when the Scottish Government is under such pressure, would also carry some credibility if once in a while they identified from where they believed the funding could be sourced. And in the case of the Tories, a dose of self-awareness wouldn't go amiss either, given their role their woeful, or in the woeful mismanagement of the economy and the impact that has on the financial position the Government finds itself in in Scotland, with all the implications that has for education. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Day. And I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Christine Graham. Up to six minutes, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I first declare that uh, I have a daughter who is a secondary school teacher. Uh, if we're going to be thorough, I also have a daughter in third year at secondary school. I'm, I'm delighted to be back again in the Chamber debating education, a subject that many of you know I think links directly into my previous health portfolio. And I've often said that I thought education is a solution to our health and welfare issues. I have listened to the Cabinet Secretary and her colleagues, but I have to say I think they're hiding from reality. So let's just pause a bit and reflect on what teachers on the ground tell us what they're not having to deal with at the moment. They are way overworked. They're so bogged down with administrative duties that many have to work on into the night. They're short-staffed. And they're having to deal with a growing mental health crisis in the classrooms. Many teachers are going off with stress, heaping even more pressure on staff. It's a vicious circle that this government do not want to acknowledge. I spoke to a teacher who is concerned that the unprecedented numbers of pupils presenting with poor mental health were so high that the fear was they would miss a sign that would lead to a tragedy. That is a dreadful cloud for teachers to have to work under. Education used to be the Scottish Government's number one priority. Judges on education, said Nicola Sturgeon, well, by any measurement, this government is failing our teachers and is failing our pupils. We start from a position where there are 815 fewer teachers than when the SNP came to power, with 19 per cent of teachers on temporary contracts, and that figure has been on a steady rise from 12 per cent in 2012. But what I would like to discuss here is the opportunity here to reset Scotland's education system, to deliver skills and opportunities based on future needs. With a net zero target for 2025, the importance of delivering on the economics of environment and climate change should be a priority. We should have an education system that has the green economy embedded in it, but on examination we find that is not the case. Scotland has some of the best wind resource in the world, much discussed recently, but not in the development of the technology. Wind turbines are imported. The servicing skills for those wind turbines is imported far too often also. Why are we not leading the world in the development of this kind of technology? And given the long and celebrated heritage that Scotland has in engineering, how can the Scottish Government justify importing so much of the green energy technologies and skills needed to hit the net zero 2045 target? Why are our schools and colleges not properly resourced to develop those skills? The SCDI report 2021 Manifesto for Green Growth notes that shortages in green skills presents the biggest challenge to clean growth. And given the scathing report today from the Climate Change Committee and the lack of any progress from the Scottish Government against its climate change targets, perhaps it's about time we started considering outcomes instead of creating sound bites. Engineering apprenticeships in my region are readily available, but there is a shortage of take-up requiring companies to search overseas to fill apprentice places. Why do our pupils feel they cannot fulfil these important roles? And of course, uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, it wouldn't be right for me not to mention the importance of extracurricular activities. I often note that the big difference between private schools and state schools, in, if, if you walk past a private school, the pupils are tripping over cellos and hockey sticks. They have the same level of teaching, same, the same level of teachers, they just have more opportunity. We on these benches would close the attainment gap, would close the attainment gap by offering the same opportunity for all, inequality of opportunity. When are the Scottish Government going to work out that is why they're failing? I'll give way to Alex. Alec Rowley. If you look at the, the, the stats, you will see that in the private schools, the teacher-pupil ratio and indeed the teacher-support-pupil ratio is far, far smaller than it is in our schools. 
Brian Whistler. Can I thank Alex Early for, for his intervention. He's, actually, he's absolutely right. But they also have an awful lot more opportunity out with the standard curriculum, which broadens their education system. In the last term, presiding officer, the SNP put education as their main priority and then promptly dropped their education bill from the programme. That would have been an opportunity to reset our education system for the future and develop the skills and resources to deliver on our children's ambitions. Instead, we have a teacher shortage and teachers stretched to capacity. We have an underfunded FE sector and we have a Scottish Government with an inability to join up the dots and link future job demands with educational output. Deputy Presiding Officer, if we want to tackle Scotland's poor health record, invest in education. If we want to grow our economy and deliver a more prosperous Scotland, invest in education. If we want to tackle welfare issues or criminality, invest in education. If we are to succeed, surely education has to mirror the job requirements of the future and then resource it to match. Education is so much more than just maths and English. It's about life skills. It's about ambitions. It's about creating enthusiasm. It's about showing our young people what is possible, pushing back boundaries and inspiring. Our teachers can do all of that if the Scottish Government would let them. Let teachers teach. Give them the tools and support they deserve to do what they are trained to do. Isn't it about time education finally was made the priority of this Government? Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Claire Baker for up to six minutes. Uh, Ms Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I speak to the Scottish Government Amendment and as a preamble advisor many moons ago, I was a secondary teacher of English. I am notorious for my pedantry, correcting those who say less instead of fewer or disinterested instead of uninterested. I'll give lessons later. Incidentally, I went on strike in the 1980s when inflation was running above 23%. I was married to an assistant head. Two teachers were primary teachers, one in Orkney and the other in Ayr. And our generations of teachers continues with a niece deputy head of a primary. I have therefore high regard for the profession, not only as a parent and grandparent. I also became accustomed to having my ear bent on all matters from those at the chalk face. I think, though we obviously disagree in many aspects, as evidenced in the motion and other amendments, that all children, young people and adult learners have the right to a first-class education and we all commend the hard work of all staff and teaching professionals in Scotland's schools, colleges, universities, early learning and childcare centres. In particular, this was tested and proved the dedication of the profession during COVID. Adapting teaching to online, individual teachers going to households to provide lesson material and keeping schools open while exposing themselves in the course of that to COVID. Turning now to how important education is to help children make the most of their talents in a comfortable environment, and in particular, helping those least well off. The mantra is closing the attainment gap, but in my book, it's closing the poverty gap. In pupil equity funding in the year 2022 to 23, Midlothian has received 174,000 or so, and Scottish borders, 225, 1,440 in pounds with more in successive years. This supports qualifying, ch qualifying children from P1 to S3. But even before that, starting with preschool, the first intervention is a baby box delivered to all requesting a brimful of high quality items. It has in the upper 90% uptake and it demonstrates in tangible terms the value of a child from the very start because education starts at birth. Then there's the provision of 1140 free hours nursery and onwards to free school meals, all P1, P5, free bus travel to all under 22. I say free, but these are choices made by the Scottish Government on its expenditure to provide as near as it can a level playing field for young people. A hungry child will have difficulty learning and with free bus travel, children have the chance to access out of school activities all part of education in its wider sense. And tuition fees were abolished in Scotland, whereas in England, a student, if not well healed, will leave with almost 30,000 in debt at the end of a three-year degree. Now, why focus on poverty in an education debate? Because while the school, the teachers will do their utmost for every child, if that child is living in a household under stress because of poverty, 
Short of food and warmth, it will be hard for that child to learn. That is why the child payment, now at £25 per week for every child under 16 in a qualifying family, is so significant, and more so when combined with other Scottish benefits I have already listed. Already £84 million has been paid out since it was introduced. If the Tory government were to reinstate the £20 per week uplift to universal credit, that would put a further £780 million into Scottish families, lifting 30,000 children out of poverty. Think of the difference that would make, bearing in mind that most people claiming universal credit are working, and how that would ease the financial concerns on households and on the children. We also need decent school buildings, and that's not easy in a time of raging inflation, impacting, for example, on materials. But in my own patch in Borders of Midlothian, three new secondary schools are on the cards. Gala Shields Academy, Peebles High School, and Beeslack, which will be built just outside my patch. None of these will be under the disgraceful PPP-PFI route, introduced by the Tories, unhappily continued under Labour and Liberal Democrats here, which has left councils carrying millions in debt, the most costly borrowing possible. In Merlothian alone, in 2021, the cost to the council of these extravagant contracts was 11 million, 12% of its education budget. In Borders, the most recent figures are 29 million, representing 8% of its education budget. Money wasted. Finally, where I started with teachers. I understand that this harsh economic climate, which has been exacerbated by Tory mismanagement, Boris, Trust and Brexit for starters, I understand the demands for pay rises. Teachers know, as this chamber knows, that the Scottish Government has a fixed budget when inflation was around 3%, not 11%, then the increased salaries means cuts elsewhere. So I hope that a middle ground will soon be found. I note Stephen Kerr too would not answer the simple question, how much for the teachers and from which budget? His contribution, and I think this appropriate in a debate on education, was, quotes, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Macbeth, Act 5, Scene 5, thanks to Miss McGuffey, circa 1960, still fondly remembered for compelling us to learn all of Shakespeare's soliloquies. Thank you, Ms. Kuhn. I now call Claire Baker to be followed by uh, Fergus Ewing for up to six minutes, Ms. Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. So the widespread disruption to education from the pandemic can't be underplayed and the impacts are continuing today. Schools reopened, but challenges of attendance and engagement do remain, and that impacts most keenly felt by the most disadvantaged groups. We have also seen falling teacher numbers, regular reports of challenging behaviour in classrooms and increasing demands being placed on teachers and school staff. Um, during the pandemic, I urged the then Cabinet Secretary for Education to commit to an equality audit when pupils returned to schools. Uh, that would be to identify where most support was needed so it could then be delivered. This audit highlighted particular negative impacts for early primary school pupils and those moving from primary to secondary, the key transition points in a child's education, as well as showing higher numbers of pupils from less advantaged backgrounds showing regression in literacy and numeracy. The Scottish Government has a responsibility to ensure that those additional gaps in learning stemming from the pandemic do not result in further disadvantage or widening of the attainment gap by providing both immediate support measures and by addressing the underlying causes of poverty. And our amendment today calls for a further assessment to be made of the impact of the pandemic so that pupils, parents and teachers can receive the support they need. We, you know, I really would want to emphasise we can't, because I think in some way the debate has moved on from the pandemic, but the impact of that will last on young people and children for a long time. And I don't think we can underestimate or forget, forget about that. Um, it's clear that beyond the wider consequences of COVID, there are particular effects for those in schools, and we need to see targeted action to address those. Absence rates do continue to be a challenge, and we need to see a plan for re-engagement um, being put into place. The Equality Audit also highlighted the impact of the pandemic on mental and physical health and well-being of children. And while I note the inclusion in the national discussion on Scottish education, there is a question on support and care for young people. We need to see an increase in provision now of services related to mental health, emotional and social well-being. 
I recently asked the Scottish Government about access to school counselling services. With around 12,000 children and young people accessing such services in the last six months of this past year, the demand for them is clear. These valuable services are often delivered by councillors who are on fixed-term contracts, but we need to see certainty both for them and the pupils they are supporting that this funding will be continued. Services like this are an example of how we, can, um, we cannot develop and support education and look at it just in isolation, but it needs to be connected to other policies and budgets. And this is a good example of how you do that. And we need a guarantee that funding support, which has been provided to the mental health strategy, will be continued next year. And alongside the ongoing impacts of COVID, the current cost of living crisis is also being felt keenly in our schools. The survey carried out by NAS UWT in the autumn found that 65% of respondents saying more pupils were going to school hungry, 58% saying more pupils didn't have the equipment they needed for lessons, and 55% saying that more pupils' families were unable to afford the school uniform. So while you know, Christine Graham has talked about the bigger picture and economic levers that need to be used and the cost of living crisis does extend beyond schools and education, we do need to see specific action being delivered through schools to address this so that the situation does not further deteriorate or have a negative impact on young people's education. We cannot have children going to school without food, clothing and materials they need. I recently visited Fairhill Primary School in Kirkcaldy to see the community shop they have set up there in response to the increased cost of living pressures faced by parents, carers and pupils. The shop is run by staff and parents with donations coming from local businesses in the community as well as larger retailers and it aims to provide clothing, cleaning products and food for free or for a small donation. It is a really good example of the community and the school coming together to support families and one which people can access without judgment. It demonstrates the need for this kind of support as well as the valuable role of schools in providing for families beyond education. So the decline that we have seen um, in significant areas in literacy and numeracy in our education system, though does predate the current crisis and the pandemic, Teacher numbers have fallen significantly since the SNP took office and the impact in a number of key subject areas is clear. Teacher shortages put further pressure on existing staff as well as limiting subject choices for pupils, which can have a knock-on effect in terms of options for future study or work. And in STEM subjects particularly, we've seen a drop in teacher numbers of over 500 since 2008, with impacts on the number of pupils taking these subjects, which are critical for major industries already facing skill shortages. These were issues raised earlier by Brian Whittle. And the message that my committee hears, the Economy and Fair Work Committee, is the message that we consistently hear around skill shortages. We need to ensure our schools are able to offer the qualification and skills that are needed to grow key sectors in our economy, but if teachers are not in place, that cannot be done. We are also seeing a fall in the provision of language courses and questions over how we are able to deliver the future skills needed for a sustainable economy based on green jobs. We need to get in place a coherent skills strategy that works with education pathways to deliver the skills that our economy requires as well as providing the opportunities and capacity for people to reskill and upskill throughout their lives. And lifelong learning used to be a touchstone of this parliament, but you know, a contraction that we've seen in the college sector has really brought an end to this ambition. So with further strike action tabled, the Scottish Government needs to act quickly to resolve the situation with teachers and provide them with a better pay deal so that further disruption to education can be avoided. If we truly value these workers, they deserve more than kind words. They deserve improved pay and conditions which recognises their vital role in society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now call Fergus Ewing to be followed by Ross Greer. Up to six minutes, Mr Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, teachers, lawyers, doctors, accountants, politicians, engineers, architects, journalists, civil servants, advisors, consultants, farmers, producers, and people in just about every occupation or job that exists in society today share one common need in these times, in this century, and that need, presiding officer, is the ability and the skill to communicate in writing and to do so with reasonable speed and accuracy. Uh, and that skill is one which can only really be developed to reach our true potential by acquiring the skill of keyboard technique or touch typing as it's known 
and employing that marvellous invention, 1868, the QWERTY keyboard. It's been around for over 150 years. Here is mine, and it's called QWERTY, as I'm sure all the very well-educated and intelligent members of this particular audience know, because the first six letters on the top three of the three ranks are the letters Q, W, E, R, T, Y. Uh, now, 50 years ago, and uh, I can remember that well, very few people actually required to touch type. And in fact, it was really only shorthand typists. Very often, they would be dictating a letter for a boss. Their skill actually was probably far superior to his, incidentally. But in those long, long forgotten uh, male chauvinist days, when women were expected to do the menial work, which in fact was more highly skilled, uh, typing was the exception, not the rule. Very few people had the skill. But now, everybody is expected to be able to communicate themselves in writing. So my plea today to the minister, and uh, I know she, she probably has heard this like a, a crack record before several times, and I must pay tribute that we had a very pleasant uh, a meeting when the minister very courteously listened to what I had to say, uh, but I haven't quite got there yet. And like Bruce and the spider, I, I do think <laughs> persistence often pays off. In fact, Calvin Coolidge, the American president, once opined, nothing in the world can take the place of perseverance. So I make no apology, uh, presiding officer, in persevering with my attempts to persuade the minister to do this. What is the plea? The plea is that we introduce, a, perhaps as a pilot, perhaps in one education authority, and I know that the Director of Education in Highland is not unsympathetic to this, a proper supervision, supervision and training program to teach our young people how to acquire this skill, a skill which I submit, perhaps more than any other that I can think of, would equip them for the rest of their working life, in my case, it's been over 40, 45 years, to perform to their absolute maximum potential and produce work at up to three times the speed of those who have to hunt and peck for the right keys. Now, the skill is called, uh, it's called cognitive automaticity. And I'm not very keen on jargon, but I thought I would try and impress you that I did know one such phrase. And what does it mean? Well, it means the skill of doing something automatically without thinking about it. And the point is, and this is why I mention it, not to show off that I, I knew it, the point, is, the, the point is that when one can touch type, you don't need to think about how to write. Your whole mental focus is on what you want to say. And that means that your mental attention is not diverted from the primary task of focusing on what it is you're trying to achieve. Now, I did raise this, of course, with uh, when I was in the Education Committee, uh, as colleagues here will, may recall. Uh, and I have to say the response from what I would call the education establishment was somewhat underwhelming. Um, I don't want to be too negative, so I'll just leave it at that there. <laughs> But their arguments against were, oh, well, voice technology will replace this. Well, no, it won't, because you need a written record of things. Voice technology doesn't really work very well at the moment. It might work in the future, but it's never going to replace having a written record. Now, the second argument is that kids can learn this by themselves. Well, they can't. They may think they can, but they can't and they don't. And if they do, they don't learn it properly. And what is required is 15 to 25 hours of supervised training. That's all. 15 to 25 hours, an investment for the next 45 years. Uh, and there is evidence, there's evidence from Holland that kids that learn how to touch type, and I won't read out the quote, I haven't got time, perform better. And from the British Educational Journal of Psychology, not my normal reading, but nonetheless, that kids who don't learn how to type perform less well. So the absence of this skill is damaging to children's education. So, uh, presiding officer, I thought I would just change the mood of the debate today. I hope I have. 
Well, I don't think I have time. The member is just winding up, I'm afraid. I, I'm very sorry, I would have, but I'm very happy to. <laughs> that's, that's a date, as they say, sorry, awesome. uh, So I commend such typing to the Cabinet Secretary and do hope that uh, she, she will seriously consider what I've had to say today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. I never thought I'd have to reprimand you for waving around your keyboard as a prop. Um, but uh, with that, I call Ross Greer to be followed by Bob Doris for up to six minutes, Mr. Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I fear this might be a little bit jarring after the last contribution, but um, I'm somewhat grateful to the Conservatives for having given us the chance to debate education today. But I have to say, I think their motion is a complete waste of Parliament's time. This was an opportunity for Stephen Kerr to dazzle us with his grand vision for Scotland schools, to either put forward an alternative to the government's reform agenda or to detail what specific shape he thinks those reforms should take. But instead, we're debating a motion full of relentless negativity and not a single proposed solution. Bizarrely, the one demand in the motion is for the Scottish Government to bring forward an education plan. From Mr Kerr's opening speech, we get the impression that he's hardly noticed that the biggest set of reforms in at least 15 years are currently underway. Education Scotland is being reformed. A new independent inspectorate is being established. The Scottish Qualifications Authority is being abolished completely and a body fit for purpose is being set up to take its place. An independent review... I'd like to take an intervention in a moment, but I'll just make a little bit of progress. Thank you. An independent review of qualifications is taking place and it's due to report this spring. And there's a national discussion covering the curriculum and everything which surrounds it. That is a major package of change. The most significant since the new curriculum was introduced. The Tories agree with plenty of this, or at least they used to. By last summer, we'd achieved a consensus amongst all parties on the need to replace the SQA and the need to establish an independent inspectorate. I know from six years of sitting on Parliament's Education Committee that MSPs of all parties have long been frustrated by the underperformance of Education Scotland and agreed on the need for change there. I recognise that we disagree significantly on the future of exams, but previous Conservative education spokespeople have certainly had thoughts about changes they would like to see to the curriculum, short of the, frankly, cynical calls to scrap the curriculum for excellence entirely. So why, when there's so much opportunity for all parties to shape these reforms, are we debating a motion which makes no proposal of its own, other than to, to, uh, other than to demand that the Scottish Government do something? Uh, I feel I should take Mr uh, Whitfield's intervention first, but I will then take an intervention from Ms Smith. Martin Whitfield. Uh, I'm very grateful to Ross Gray in, in giving way. Does he not agree with me, though, that the new SQA is going to mark its own homework? And that was one of the great challenges the existing SQA has with the proposals the government announced last week. Ross Gray. Thank you. I'm grateful to, uh, for that intervention because that was actually one of the recommendations in Ken Muir's report that I personally struggled with the most. And I, I made my hesitation about endorsing that recommendation clear to the government and to Mr Muir. And it was for the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary set out, whereby if we split the functions and had one set within the new education Scotland, it in fact is going to sit far closer to government. It won't have the independence that we desire for it. And I haven't seen any suggestions that in fact uh, that accreditation function should set an entirely independent body somewhere else. I think what we need to look at is if we're having both of these set within the same body, the qualifications agency that has greater independence from government, how do we create a silo between those two functions, a separation between those two functions, so that they are both sufficiently separate from government but from each other as well. And that's an opportunity that we have through this reform process. Process. I'll take Ms Smith's intervention as Liz well. Smith. Uh, Mr Greer, I think I remember, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, that on three occasions when the Conservatives had a motion on education, the Greens, Labour and Liberals all voted with us because you were concerned about SNP education policy. What happened to that persuasion that you have with your Ministers now? Ross Greer, and I can give you some of that time back. I Appreciate that, President Officer. Uh, Ms Smith is quite right. In the last session, we were deeply concerned about SNP <laughs> education policy, which is why, which is why off the back, or particularly off the back of the SQA shambles in 2020, but since then, we've managed to persuade not just the Greens, but others as well, we've managed to persuade the government to take a different path. We collectively, the opposition parties in the last session, forced the SNP to withdraw an education reform bill that would not have addressed the challenges in education. But we are now seeing a series of reforms that Ms Smith will know I've campaign for for a long time, particularly around reform of exam and assessment, particularly around replacement of the SQA. We are now seeing a reform package much closer to what the Greens have been proposing over many years than what we saw 
in the last session. I mean, take exams as a specific example. The Greens are looking forward to the results of Professor Hayward's review early next year. That process is a direct result of our intervention in the 2020 SQA scandal, because we didn't think it was good enough to simply restore the grades and move on, essential as it was to do that. The 2020 incident and the comparative data sets we have from pre-pandemic versus those alternative models in each pandemic year made clear a deeper problem in our qualification system, one which some of us have been pointing out for many years. Why is it that the traditional high-stakes end-of-term exam model, the one we've used since the Victorian era, results in such a wide attainment gap between those from the most and least deprived backgrounds, whereas models which base grades on evidence generated through continuous assessment or teacher judgment result in a far narrower gap? I've never believed that the high-stakes exam model was the most accurate or useful way of assessing a young person's knowledge and abilities. They always felt more like tests of how quickly you could write things down or how much memorised content you could just recite on cue. And of course, they leave young people vulnerable to having their course in life thrown off by a single bad day, whether it be due to sickness, lack of sleep the night before, or any other reason. But now we have a data set which strongly suggests that they also contribute to a wider attainment gap than would otherwise have been the case. And that shouldn't come as a huge surprise. There's plenty of evidence to show that young people from the most deprived backgrounds are more likely to experience a chaotic household situation and thus be more at risk of the kind of disruption which would hamper their ability to achieve their best at that one opportunity provided by the high stakes exam system. Continuous assessment models, on the other hand, are better able to recognise a young person's true knowledge and abilities through the generation of evidence over time. So no one incident scuppers their chances of getting the grade they deserve. <laughs> President officer, of course there are challenges in our education system. The government is trying to solve them. Take last week's additional support for a learning action plan and the commitments from the Greens manifesto that it includes. The opposition doesn't need to agree and absolutely should scrutinise these reform plans. But when no alternative is provided, I can't come to any other conclusion than the fact that the opposition doesn't take itself particularly seriously. I'm greatly relieved that the Tories seem to have no plan to re uh, replace this SNP Green Government. If they had a plan to replace us, presumably they would have a plan to actually implement their own policy agenda, but they don't seem to have one. This Government, on the other hand, does have a plan. Reform is underway despite the challenges, and I'm looking forward to seeing the results of those reforms. Thank you, Mr Gray. I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Up to six minutes, Mr Doris. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Um, as Brian Whittle had done, likewise, perhaps I should declare an interest. I was a secondary school teacher for around 10 years before being elected to Parliament. I want to say a, a little bit about the poverty-related attainment gap, uh, which has been spoken about this afternoon. But we should just remind ourselves, first of all, exactly what we mean by that. That's been lost a little bit. Uh, those from lower-income households, families who are experiencing the day-to-day -day grind of poverty, their children not having their skills, their abilities, and their talents recognised fully and accredited within Scotland's education system. And tackling that attainment gap is therefore based on both what happens within education, which we'll return to, but also how we support families more generally living in our communities blighted by poverty. And we have to acknowledge, it's reasonable to acknowledge, that child poverty levels in Scotland, whilst remaining far too high, remain clearly lower than Conservative-controlled England, and Labour-controlled Wales. That's just a fact. And it's easy to see why. And it's a clear Scottish Government commitment to tackling child poverty. And let me provide just a few examples. Of course, the groundbreaking Scottish child payment. Now £25 a week for children and households on qualifying benefits. To date, £84 million put into those households since it was established. No rape clause, no two-child two -child remit, just getting the money. And can we remind ourselves, Parliament, that the call from campaigners was for £5 a week, not £25 a week. Let's just remember that. Of course, Mr Rowley made the point about, it's about how you direct resources. And of course, we could take that £84 million and give it to local government or give it to the NHS. But that's a direct resource commitment to the poorest families in Scotland. And I support that. We could also mention the school clothing grant. National minimum standards now apply of £120 for primary school children and £150 for secondary school children. I go and talk about free school meals, something I was proud that this parliament acted on something when I was elected in 2007, was something I was really keen to see extended. But I want to look about what happens in schools. And it is worth noting that resources in schools, you could look at teacher numbers, of course. And that has risen now for six years in a row. Up 885 on the previous year, 
and on track to deliver our commitment to recruiting at least 3,500 teachers and 500 classroom assistants. Back, one moment, backed by an investment during COVID of £240 million, and then an additional permanent baked in £145.5 million to make many posts permanent. Michael Mara. Recognise though that those numbers are still below the level they were in 2007 when he was elected to this parliament and this government took office. Bob Doris. I, I'm happy to reflect and you look at the numbers and you, you're right to try and make that point, Mr. Mara. But I would point out the teacher pupil ratio, which is at almost record levels, and that is a key point as well. But I think Mr. Mara fails to recognise. And I want to comment a little bit on progress on attainment levels. We know that for the number of 18-year-olds from the most deprived backgrounds been offered a place at university <coughs> is at a record high. It's up 32% since 2019, the last year that there were exams. Um, and we know that pupils who left school in the last year went on to positive destinations. That was 93.2%. The record high was actually 93.3%. That's good going. In St Rock Secondary School in my constituency, the figure was 100%, and I pay absolute tribute to them in a particularly deprived area. If we look at exam results for 2022, progress was made. Not enough. I readily accept that. At National 5, the gap between those at the highest income levels and the lowest income levels shrank from 17.1% to 14.6%. And if you look at it for hires, it went from 16.9% to 15 per cent. I say again, not enough, but that's progress. But actually, presiding officer, given the fact we've just faced a global pandemic for two years and disruption in education, you might have anticipated figures would have been worse, not improved. That's a significant achievement that Stephen Kern, the Conservatives, want to wish away in the debate this afternoon. Now, the Education Committee published a recent report on the Scottish Attainment Challenge, and that was a constructive approach to addressing inequalities in schools. That may have been due in part that constructive approach to a, a new education convener, Sue Weber, who I see is here this afternoon. It would, of course, be impolite to mention who the previous convener of that committee was, but I'm sure Mr Kerr could inform Parliament if anyone is interested. Our interrogation of evidence that we heard during that inquiry it was really, really interesting. And we heard particularly from schools in Glasgow and the west of Scotland, based at an event that's at Rocks in my constituency, about concerns that a lot of really good work that took place in addressing the poverty lift attainment gap may be ditched because of issues about trying to secure those gains during the global, pand during the global pandemic and the impact on Scottish education. So they were saying to us, don't ditch the reforms, stick with it. Now, I want to say a little bit the time I've got left, uh, presiding officer, a bit further in higher education. Uh, the Commissioner for Fair Access said that in terms of uh, that access, our success was unambiguous success. It spoke about uh, exceeding our target to 16% entrance by 2021 for the most socially deprived backgrounds into further and higher into higher education. But the reason I'm rushing this a little bit, uh, presiding officer, I know I'm running out of time a little bit, because we've got a fantastic track record, but I do have concerns, and I want to put those concerns on record. 60% of all young people uh, who are from SIMD20 who have a place at university in first year came through a further education route. And further education, as everyone in the other sector is, is facing a flat cash settlement. And you I am need really to conclude, worried Mr. about the community work the courses and the staffing implications and the, on the on consequence the, the onward consequences for making further progress in addressing that attainment gap and getting young people into higher education. I don't have the answer do you need to that. To conclude, Mr. Doris, I do have, I'm going to have to ask you to sit down. Reality. Sorry. I now call Murdo Fraser, who joins us online, um, and uh, it will be followed by John Mason. Up to six minutes, Mr. Fraser. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, as others have done, I should declare an interest because I am married to a primary school teacher. Now, the, the duty of educating our young people is one of the primary functions of government. And one of the ways we should measure the effectiveness and success of a government is how it performs that function. And as our motion makes clear this afternoon, in too many respects, this SNP government has been failing our young people. Scottish education was once regarded 
as being the envy of the world. But in recent years, we've been slipping down the international league tables until, of course, the SNP government took the decision to withdraw us from many of these uh, international comparisons. So we can no longer track that. But today and tomorrow, as Willie Rennie reminded us earlier, we see secondary schools across Scotland closed as a result of strike action, the first such strike action in a generation. And that means that young people in senior school, some of them looking to set their prelims for hires or nat fives in just a few weeks time, will see a further disruption to their education. And we have the prospect of further strikes into January when these prelims are actually being set. And these are young people who, we have to remember, have already suffered because of COVID long interruptions in their education. The strikes are ostensibly around the issue of pay, but there are many other issues that affect teachers who feel undervalued as a profession. And I'm particularly concerned about the issue of the growth of violence in the classroom. There were nearly 20,000 recorded attacks on school teachers last year. That's a 10% rise on 2018-19, the last full year before COVID. And in aggregate since 2017 to 18, there have been almost 75,000 recorded physical or verbal attacks on teachers. That's an extraordinary statistic. Stephen Kerr said earlier that there was an attack every three minutes. And he was half right, because there won't be an attack every three minutes in schools today, because many schools are closed today because of the strikes. Now, no one should have to go to their workplace at risk of physical or verbal attack, but that is the reality facing too many teachers today. In the words of the former EIS president, Heather Hughes, quoted in the Herald in June, violent incidents are happening more and more in our schools because young people and teachers are not getting the support they need to prevent them from happening. And she went on to say, Teachers often feel unsupported when reporting these issues. All too often they're made to feel that the blame lies with them and not with the lack of support for young people who are expressing their frustrations over the lack of appropriate help. In 2021 to 22, the, the number of attacks on school teachers rose despite a record number of pupils missing more than 50% of the school year because of COVID. And in addition to the bare statistics, which are bad enough, we hear anecdotally from parents just how serious the problem has become, with a concern in some quarters that COVID-related interruptions to education have changed the culture in the classroom, making unacceptable behaviour more of a norm. And we see the outcome of this manifest in the fact that we had teachers in Northfield Academy in Aberdeen voting to strike just last month over school violence feeling unsupported by the Education Authority, as Liam Kerr reminded us earlier in the debate. And in Glasgow, teachers at Bannerman High School voted to hold 12 days of strikes in the run-up to Christmas holidays over violent and abusive pupil behaviour. It is a problem which is only getting worse. Now, it's clearly unacceptable that teachers are being put at risk in this way. It is no wonder that some are leaving the profession some are taking early retirement, and we see in the strikes that are taking place a manifestation of the unhappiness teachers have with their lot. And this situation doesn't just impact on the teachers. A teacher having to devote a large proportion of their time to try and deal with a disruptive pupil means that the others in the class do not get the support and attention that they deserve. This situation cannot be unrelated to the decline, the staggering decline in the number of school exclusions since the SNP came to power. In 2007-8, there were 39,717 exclusions in Scottish schools. In 2018-19, the last year before COVID, that has fallen to just 14,990. That's a drop of 25,000 or an incredible 62%. And I cannot believe that this reduction reflects improving behaviour in the classroom. Indeed, all the other evidence suggests the opposite. Instead, what we are seeing is the consequence of a top-down policy to reduce the use of exclusion as a management tool. The drive to reduce the number of school exclusions simply means that there are more disruptive pupils being kept in a classroom environment when they should be put elsewhere. And we do need to consider 
whether an agenda of mainstreaming those who have serious behavioural issues is appropriate, or whether some alternative provision should be made for them. Presiding officer, we cannot go on as we are. Attacks in schools are reaching a crisis point, and this is something the Scottish Government has to address. Otherwise, we will see more industrial action from frustrated teachers, as is already happening. Presiding officer, there is a dismal air of complacency about this government's approach to education. That needs to change. And in this debate, the Scottish Conservatives have set out the improvements that need to be made. The SNP, with the backing of the Greens, will win the vote this afternoon. But in so, do so doing, they're going to let down the teachers and the pupils across Scotland who deserve so much better. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. I now move on to the final speaker in the open debate, Mr. Mason, up to six minutes, please. Hey, thank you very much. And can I start by saying that I believe Scotland still has an excellent education system. Our universities have no tuition fees for students, and we have a high percentage of young people going to university. There has been considerable progress with more people from disadvantaged backgrounds going to university, and we certainly want that trend to continue. And we have to say we have some tremendous universities. It, let me get into this a little bit more. In recent years, The Times and The Guardian have ranked St Andrews as the top university in the UK. No mean achievement. Mr Kerr. Stephen Kerr. Well, Tom Mason, he's, he's falling into the trap of this, this idea that university is what education is all about. It, there is a huge disparity of esteem between all the various routes that a young person can take in life. Let's not put a premium on universities. Let's back our young people when they choose other options John well. Mason. I think I was going on to say that and, uh, because my very next line is, having said that, apprenticeships are a great route too and are definitely a better option for some young people. Perhaps some schools have overemphasised going to university as the only measure of success and I think we probably need to redress that balance. There is also an issue with still relatively few women going into certain careers, for example engineering and other STEM subjects. One figure I saw recently showed that only 25% of students in these subjects are women. And again, relatively few men are entering primary teaching, childcare, and the wider care sector. Colleges, too, are a key part of our education system. And I'm very pleased that we have three colleges in Glasgow, City of Glasgow, Kelvin, and Clyde. Kelvin and Clyde, in particular, have a strong reputation for drawing folk in who are further from the education system. I was at a Kelvin College graduation recently and was struck by the incredibly diverse range of students, a real mixture of age, ethnic background and social background. It seems to be much easier now to move on from college to university, a step that was often fraught with difficulty in the past. And I do accept that there's an issue with funding for colleges, as Bob Dor Doris was hinting at, and whether the way resources are shared out between schools, colleges and universities has currently got the right balance the colleges certainly feel that they are treated as the poor relations. Last time I looked at Glasgow University's uh, accounts, they had £1,000 million in their reserves. So a university like that is incredibly rich, richer than the Scottish Government, and compared to the colleges and newer universities. Moving on to schools, I do think we are turning out young people who are more rounded than they were in days gone by. When I was at school, declaring my interest, the sole measure of success seemed to be academic, and many of us lived in fear of our teachers. When I visit a school nowadays, it seems to me that there is a much healthier relationship between teachers and pupils on the whole, and more of a sense of working together to achieve the best outcomes. No, I'm sorry, I have already. Denominational or Catholic schools also have a valuable place in our education system. And while, of course, there must be common standards across our schools, and especially when it comes to examinations. No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to carry on. It is good that parents are also involved and can choose to some extent the ethos of the school they want their children to go to. Speaking of parents and parental involvement, we must not underestimate the importance of this. I remember one head teacher saying to me that the school he led was almost like two schools. On the one hand, the children whose parents were enthusiastic about their children's education were engaged and got involved in homework, etc. And then there were those where the parents were not really involved. And I know that at least one school in my constituency has used the PEF money specifically to try to build up relationships with the families. 
Of course, we need to do all we can to help and support and encourage those pupils who do not have parental support, but I think we have to accept that there is a limit to what a school can do if the parents are not engaged. And this is where families coming into an area from an African or Asian background can be a big boost to a school. In such cases, the whole family is often highly committed to education, and such highly motivated students can give a real lift to the whole school and can encourage other young people who are perhaps less self-motivated. In relation to schools, can I also say how much I appreciated having Maureen McKenna as Glasgow's Director of Education, and I know that her replacement, Douglas Hutchison, has a hard act to follow. And I also very much welcome in Glasgow the develop of a, development of a new Gaelic medium primary school in Calton in the East End. And I guess we can't talk about schools without looking at teachers' pay. The Labour Amendment calls for a fair pay deal, and the Lib Dems also refer to fair pay. But what exactly do they mean by that? Scottish teachers are being offered £35,000 once qualified. I understand that is more, £7,000 more than in England and would be the third highest in the G7 group of wealthy nations. Uh, very quickly, yes. Very um, briefly, Martin Whitfield. I, I'm very grateful, but you do recognise that obviously the teaching profession is Sc in Scotland is a graduate-only profession compared to England. John Mason. Yes. And, and there's a question... <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, question, there's a question of fairness too. If, teachers are a hugely important part of our society, but so are other local council workers. And how could it be right to give teachers a substantially bigger rise than their colleagues in other parts of local government? And that is not to even mention affordability. Higher pay deals to match inflation may well be deserved by many, but they effectively mean cuts to services either in local government, the NHS or elsewhere. So please let's not overstate the weaknesses or understate the achievements of our education system, as I fear some of our opposition parties are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Mason. We now move to closing speeches. I call firstly Martin Whitfield for up to six minutes. Mr. And I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it has been a fascinating debate, one in which we have seen passion about probably the most important thing in any person's life, and that is their first few years through education. That time when they can hope and dream anything, be an astronaut, be a footballer, be a nurse, be a pilot. They can do that. And it is our education environment, it is those professionals that work with them, and not just the teachers, but those who help out in the classrooms, help out in the dining hall. Indeed, pick them up sometimes when they tumble in the playground and have a blooded knee to keep that imagination going, to keep that positivity in our young people. And it is right to say... Um, Brian Wood. Member, to give an intervention. Would you agree with me that to be able to keep that sort of passion going, you have to be able to see it? So when we reduce our sport and our art and our music and our drama within schools, we actually take away opportunity from our children. Martin Whitfield. I'm very, I'm very, gra very grateful for that intervention, and you have stolen my recommendation of your contribution. Um, but it is right, and let's take a moment to pause that, to say education is more, with the greatest respect to Liz Smith, than just being able to read, write and count, essential as that is. But it is also the experience of drama, of art, of music, of dance, of physical education, of sport, when your team that you're playing in wins and don't win, when you move from being the last selected in the playground through to the first when you discover that the soft skills that you practice with your friends, with groups around you, can keep you out of fights, can offer a better empathy going forward. And that is an essential element that I fear, in so much discussion, gets lost about our young people's lives. But they have suffered major disruption to their learning because of the pandemic. And teachers are now striking. They're fighting for a better pay deal. And it is the responsibility of the SNP government to be at those negotiating tables. It is one of the very few negotiations where the government has a seat. And you should use that. You should take the professional skill. The government should lead on that to find a way to reconcile. It's what negotiation is about. We have heard the claim that education has been this government's priority but we have serious failings at every level. The attainment gap is stubbornly wide, whether you call it an attainment gap or a poverty-related attainment gap, and it is growing. Our colleges, as so many contributions have said, do feel neglected, and they are facing the prospect of massive cuts to their staff. And our students, they're having to drop out of university because they can't find anywhere to live. 
This is what we are offering our young people, the hope of the future. And to listen to some of the contributions today, and it has been interesting because I think there have been some really positive contributions. There has to be a recognition, and I think, as Dr Ali rightly pointed out, there has to be a recognition where there is failure, where there is more to be done. Because actually, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. It is what is the Scottish Government going to do about putting it better. And they will find cross-party support for ideas that will be implemented to improve the experience that our young people go through. I was very grateful um, to the intervention regarding the Government's statement um, because there is a concern that by not splitting those two factors, people are just marking their own homework which is one of the significant reasons the SQA got in. So I was very grateful to hear of the idea of properly sequestrating those two roles. And I would love to hear the Cabinet Secretary's view on how that's going to, going to be achieved. I would like to also, shall I make, I will make mention of Brian Whittle's contribution because it did lead to the discussion about the role, and I'm going to use this word very carefully, culture and sport in young people's lives but also because of his call to reset the skills priority about what this economy needs going forward by way of the green economy and the net zero. We need to provide those skills. We need to provide the ability for our young people and indeed older people to gain those skills so that we can drive forward this economy. I want to mention Claire Baker's um, contribution with regard to the equality audit because that was the first time we started to see the damage that COVID has really done to our young people. And she is right that for so many adults, we have moved on from COVID. But the reality for young people's lives, both those right at the start of their primary school experience and before, who may not be able, be able to name what the challenge was, through to those that moved on to high school, there is massive challenges that have come about by COVID and we are not addressing them properly. I am aware of young people who are having to travel by taxi between schools to get the range of lessons, particularly with modern languages, that they need. That is a tragedy in 2022, that we have young people passionate about foreign language, but having to find their own way to learn. I do want to pause very quickly in the short time that I have left to make mention of Fergus Ewing. I, I, I was severely disappointed that Fergus Ewing wasn't able to take my intervention on touch typing, because it would be lovely to hear at what age should that skill be acquired. And just like, as he discussed, the automaticity of touch typing, that is what exists in handwriting. When people learn to write, they just write. It doesn't hold back their ideas and their imaginations. And that goes to the gap that is existing and the challenges that some young people have to attain these skills. We have classrooms that are large. We have teachers that are pressurised by individuals in the classroom that take a huge amount of time. That is a cry for help from that young person. But we need to facilitate the support for it. So, in conclusion, it's been a fascinating debate. There is so much more to be done. I would urge the Scottish Government not to fear the criticism that they have heard today, but to accept it, but to move forward, come forward with proposals that will find cross-party support here in Scotland. Because education, education, education is the single greatest gift that we can give our young people and the population here. I'm grateful, Deputy Thanks, Presiding Thank you, Mr Whitfield. I now call um, the Cabinet Secretary uh, to wind up for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, there has been, uh, I suppose we could say, uh, a mixed range of speeches for um, today. Uh, unfortunately, those, particularly from the Conservatives, um, have had one thing um, in common, with perhaps uh, the um, exception of Brian Whittle, I would uh, be fair to him in his contribution, and that's a lot of noise, uh, but no actual substantive policy proposals about how we take things forward. There is uh, a great deal that is in the Conservative uh, motion. Uh, there are no genuine attempts at how we move forward uh, with policy on education. And I would point to, and I'll, I'll make some progress uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll take some interventions in due course. Uh, there has been uh, a great deal of challenge towards the Scottish Government about being open to new ideas, uh, about being ready uh, to listen to others. We've just had the national discussion. The biggest debate we've had on Scottish education for the past 20 years has just closed. Now, I don't think, and I'm happy to stand corrected uh, from any uh, party in the room, that they've actually taken part in that. 
Uh, we had that opportunity. Uh, the co-facilitators met uh, with uh, those from the opposition um, benches, and we had that opportunity to build that consensual uh, mission. But instead, what we've had once again from the Tories is a focus on SNP bad and very little else. Uh, Liz Smith. Thank you. I'd be very happy to send her copies of the presentations that I have made to previous calls from the SNP to ask for our views. And I think my colleague Jamie Green did the same when he was uh, in charge. And I know that Pam Gozel has. Would she accept that we have made presentations? Governor Secretary. Well, I, I would accept uh, the constructive um, uh, role that Liz Smith had when she was education spokesperson. Uh, I wonder where we are on the Tory party benches, though, on whether we support curriculum for excellence, as I think Liz Smith did in her time, or whether they're still scrapping it, which has been the more recent policy. So I'll look back on Tory party policies of the past, but it is a bit difficult, uh, presiding officer, to know what their position still is, particularly on key aspects around curriculum for excellence that have been uh, very positively uh, looked at by the OECD, for example. But a number of speakers, Cocab Stewart being one of them, spoke about the positive destinations uh, for our young people. She's quite right uh, to do that. She pointed quite rightly to the results and that they are a credit to our young people, but also that they are a fundamental function of our education system. An education system that is doing its best to support our children and young people at a time of great difficulty. And Alec Rowley was quite right to point out, although the Tories did not like it, about the impact of Tory austerity and the cost of living crisis and the impact that is having right across Scotland. And it is very important that we recognise, yes, what schools can do, but the context in which they are working in is made more difficult by the levels of poverty, something that I will come back to if I have time. And it is also very important that we do celebrate what is right in Scottish education. So, the higher spending per child in education in Scotland than compared to elsewhere in the UK. Almost 130,000 leavers uh, receiving SQA results in the past year. The best educated population in Europe, according to most recent Eurostat, 1140 hours in ALC being developed. I could go on, presiding officer, but I will attempt to take another intervention. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful that the Cabinet Secretary has taken the intervention. I find it staggering that the Cabinet Secretary has yet to Mr. deal Kerr, with the violence. Mr Kerr, your microphone point. isn't on. Have you got your card? It's me that's come on. Yeah, that's fine. I Mr. find Kerr. it staggering that the Cabinet Secretary has yet to deal with the violence points that have been brought up by Stephen Kerr by Myrtle Fraser, by myself earlier on. Uh, and uh, so I ask, what precisely mm -hmm. has the Cabinet Secretary put in place since taking up her post, which will reduce the physical and verbal abuse that has been raised, given this is not a new problem? Cabinet Secretary, I can give you up to eight minutes. And a situation I was uh, due to come to, President Officer, but I'm happy uh, to move to that point now. Everybody in the chamber that's raised this is quite right to do so because no teacher, no one, in fact, should uh, go to any uh, place of work and suffer verbal or physical abuse. Now, it is for schools and councils to decide on what action to be taken in each case because councils are the employer. But I did meet with the COSLA spokesperson just last week to discuss what more the Scottish Government can do to help. And indeed, uh, I was due to be at a meeting um, on this with COSLA and other stakeholders uh, this very afternoon, had it not been for work on this debate. So I think, I hope that demonstrates uh, that I would have actually been spending time exactly um, on this issue. But I am, of course, delighted to be here discussing another Tory motion on education. There is an issue that we have to look very carefully at, of course, around I mean, I'm sorry, but if, if Conservative Party members um, don't like it, they should feel free to actually intervene, presiding officer, rather than a constant chuntering from a sedentary position. But we have seen a number of comments also on the aspects around teacher workload. Of course, that's exactly why we have a commitment to reduce class contact time about more teachers. That's exactly why we have a commitment for 3,500 extra teachers by the end of parliamentary term. And on mental health, of course, our commitment to counsellors in schools. Uh, there is, for example, a thousand more teachers in our secondary schools than before the pandemic. Now, Christine Graham and Bob Doris quite rightly again pointed to the aspects and the challenges around poverty. That is a very important point that we do need to look at. 
We, as the Scottish Government and in conjunction with local government, are determined to substantially eliminate the poverty-related attainment gap. But it is a real shame that the Tories seem to be doing their level best to undermine that mission and make that more challenging, given the state of the economy and the state of society at this point. It would be remiss of me, Presiding Officer, um, in the final moments that I have, not uh, to reference Fergus uh, Ewing's uh, speech. Persistence uh, does pay off. I admire his tenacity and I do appreciate his ongoing discussions with Highland Council and I look forward uh, to seeing how that develops, uh, Presiding Officer. John Mason quite rightly pointed out uh, many of the aspects about Scottish education that we should be proud of and the importance of all of them, universities, colleges, apprenticeships, and I would pay... With apologies, I'll need to move on at this point, but I would pay particular tribute to colleges like Kelvin College eh, and the fantastic work they do and the important role that denominational schools have in our society. Presiding officer, there are a number of aspects around Scottish education that we should rightly be proud of and that we are quite rightly commended for internationally. It is disappointing that, once again, we have heard very little from that about the Tories today. I recognise that we can improve. That's why we've had the national discussion it's a shame no one seemed to notice and take part. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call May and Gallagher to wind up the debate uh, for up to nine minutes. Ms Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier this year, life as I knew it changed forever as I became a first-time mum. I will never forget the moment I met my daughter and how she instantly became the most important person to me and my immediate family. It has to be said that being part of the parent club is genuinely one of the best feelings in the world. I've been so fortunate to spend the last few months learning how to become a mum. As we know, there is no step-by-step -step manual and every baby has a different personality and milestones. But I am looking to uh, returning to my MSP role fully in January. And if I may, and before I get into the premise of today's debate, um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for the well wishes and to my constituents who have been understanding of my maternity leave. And of course, my fantastic office team who have really gone above and beyond to keep my office running smoothly. <laughs> Presiding officer, Every child in Scotland should have the same opportunities in life, regardless of their postcode or family dynamic. As we have heard this afternoon, every MSP in this chamber agrees with this, although there are stark differences in policies and how we believe Scotland is performing compared to other countries. My colleague Stephen Kerr correctly outlined the importance of giving every child a golden ticket to their first class education. He raised serious concerns about the violence and threats that our teachers face on a daily basis in our classrooms, and this was echoed by Myrtle Fraser, but not by the Cabinet Secretary until prompted by other members in this chamber. Yeah. And when we discuss education issues, it doesn't help when we have a Scottish Government that refuses to listen to experts, academics, parents and opposition po politicians when they raise genuine concerns over the state of the education system. Therefore, it will come as no surprise that most of my contribution today will focus on the Scottish Government's flagship policy of providing every child in Scotland with 1140 hours of free childcare. I do feel like a broken record when it comes to 1140 hours, but if I didn't have a vested interest in childcare before, I certainly do now. When this Government introduced this expansion to the already existing childcare policy, the SNP said it would deliver three main benefits. Number one, children's development improves and the poverty-related attainment gap narrows. Two, more parents will have the opportunity to be in work, training or study. And three, <coughs> increased family resilience through improved health and well-being of parents and children. And I would like to start on a positive note. In principle, 1140 hours is a good policy. The First Minister herself hailed the policy as transformative. It has the potential to give children the best possible start in life as it removes the financial burden on parents who often struggle with the cost of childcare. And this is especially true for working mums, as many choose to pause or stop their career progression to start a family. I don't believe that in 2022 a woman should have to choose between her career or children, and the onus is on this Parliament to give them the tools so they can do both successfully. But as it stands, the ELC policy is not working. And it is my view, and indeed the view of many in the early years industry, that these aims will never be achieved should the government continue to ignore that a crisis has emerged in the early learning and childcare sector. 
It is not enough to simply have a good policy idea without having the willpower and determination to see it through. And as Brian Whittle said, we have an opportunity to reset Scotland's education system. Presiding officer, since my election to the Scottish Parliament and during my time as a councillor in North Lanarkshire, I have been in direct contact with nurseries in the private, voluntary and independent sector. They have told me on several occasions about the deeply rooted problems with 1140. These include the financial inequality that exists between the PVI and local authority nurseries, a staffing crisis and a loss of childminders, parents not obtaining their first, second or third choice of nursery setting for their child, PVI settings closing as they cannot afford to run their businesses due to the 11... Yes, certainly. Michael Mara, I appreciate the member giving way. I, I, I really appreciate this uh, area of our speech, given uh, problems in Huntley, in my region, where uh, the, the inspectorate has resulted in the closure of a nursery and the council is not stepping up to take that weight. Um, does she believe that the inspectorate need to do more with the government to ensure that there is provision where they find a nursery has to close? Megan Gallagher. Absolutely. Um, and again, I'll, I'll be able to touch on that later on in my contribution. Um, the levels of bureaucracy created through the mountains of paperwork and the cross-boundary issues that exist due to councils not working collect. Um, I'd like to continue on just now, but I will take you later if that's okay. Um, the cross-boundary issues that exist due to councils not working collegiately to deliver funded childcare. What used to be a healthy competitive market between the PVI nurseries and local authorities has now resulted in councils being the kingmaker, leaving many PVI nurseries in a checkmate position. The PVI sector have fought tooth and nail to try and make the rate process fair, but when the funding structure set by the Scottish Government in COSLA allows local authorities to pay ELC staff 30 to 50 per cent more than in the than they fund the PVI settings, with 65% of PVI nurseries fees being controlled by the 1140 hours policy, you can see exactly where the problem lies. And the NDNA have said that low or static rates principally meant a real-time cut in funding for settings and threatens the existence of some nurseries. Excuse me, Ms Gallagher. Could I ask those who have just come into the chamber to desist from the low-level muttering um, and uh, respect the fact that somebody is uh, contributing in the debate? Megan Gallagher. I'm continue. very grateful, presiding officer. Um, the NDNA said the rates given are not sustainable since they are not keeping up with inflation but also with rising economic and living costs. Nurseries are finding it more and more difficult to meet the cost of delivery, which could result in the potential loss of smaller settings. The, the issue of 1140 that really gets me angry is that under the SNP's 1140-hour policy, a child in a private sector nursery appears to be worth less than a child in a local authority setting. No child should ever be worth less or more when it comes to getting the best possible start in life. This SNP government are fully aware of the problems, but there is yet to be any update to, provided to Parliament on how they intend to fix the policy or to make it fair for all partners involved. And while the SNP remains silent on the issue, nurseries will continue to close. I said I'll take you in a little while. Um, a business will not survive... A business will not survive if they were not able to identify and correct issues relating to their model. So I don't see why this government should be exempt from acknowledging the problems the PVI sector experience daily. And it's not like this issue is not reported time and time and again in the press. And as recently as this week, a case study was reported in the Herald of a childminder losing their income to complete paperwork as the sector is in crisis. She revealed that she is losing in excess of £600 a month as she has to commit a full day each week to complete paperwork that she is not paid for. The childminder blamed the exercise levels on the bureaucracy I mentioned earlier and it is having a huge impact on her business. She said we can't do paperwork when we've got children in our care. I absolutely love the job I do. I love watching children develop and being a key part of that. But what I'm in effect doing is paperwork for a job I love, but I'm not being paid for it. And this childminder is not alone. What has become clear to me is that the Scottish Government have been in power for so long, and we heard this earlier with Liz Smith's contribution and the timeline of failings, that they have lost the will and desire to fix their failing policies. Opposition po politicians are often told in this chamber by the SNP that we don't come to the table 
with any solutions. So for the benefit of the Cabinet Secretary and others, here are solutions that will make 1140 hours fair for both local authorities and the PVI sector. And I'm happy to give way to the Minister on this point with regards to the fixing of the funding formula. Will she commit to a review of the funding formula to make it fair for the PVI sector and local authority nurseries? I think offering to take an intervention when you've got 15 seconds to go is... Well, it's a yes-no answer, presiding officer. It is a yes-no answer, presiding officer. Minister, are you... Minister? If, if the member will uh, perhaps remember that I met her on this very issue prior to her going on to maternity leave, and I welcome her back to the chamber. It's very nice to see her, and congratulations. And we work very closely with the representatives of PVI sector, including uh, Childminders Association, and I'm more than happy to meet with her again and update her on all the work that's been going on while she has been taking care of her little daughter. Megan Gallagher, if you could begin by winding up, please. I'll take that as a no, presiding officer, but I understand that I've got to conclude my remarks now. Um, so we've heard today, presiding officer, the damning reports from members across this chamber, and it's about time that this SNP government gets a grip of our education system for the benefit of our children in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on the state of Scottish education system. It's uh, now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of a business motion uh, 7120 in the name of George Adam uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I'm moved. Thank you. I now call Alexander Burnett to speak to a move amendment 7120.1. Mr Burnett. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I apologise for short notice to speak on today's business motion and on my amendment, which I move. Now, throughout the journey of a GRR bill through Parliament, we have consistently asked for more time to be given to this legislation against the background of tunnel vision from the SNP to wrap everything up before Christmas. The SNP have ignored our requests with excuses that seem to change each time the matter is raised. The most recent one from the First Minister suggesting that because the issue was loosely mentioned by the government six years ago, that somehow counts as half a decade of scrutiny uh, of a text of a bill is utterly ridiculous. Yep. Or, for example, the Minister for Parliamentary Business telling me that there's such a busy programme that we couldn't possibly take our time uh, over a bill, meanwhile granting an extension to the Hunting with Dogs Bill to allow the Minister to fly to Egypt. <laughs> And that didn't stop business from other parts of this parliament being completely sidelined by this drive to avoid a gender vote in 2023. The last week before Christmas could have had a petitions committee debate or an update on the national planning framework or perhaps more scrutiny on the budget than the 40 minutes of questions we're currently limited to. Even the Bureau's own strategic planning meeting has been punted into the new year. There is no good reason for the government to be going to this length to push all else out of the way. We are simply asking that adequate time be given to this bill for scrutiny and that this does not come at the expense of other important business of Parliament. So what possible reason could the Scottish Government have for being so opposed to having Stage 3 in the new year? Well, presiding officer, last time I raised this question in the Chamber, I alluded to a secret answer being the true factor behind the hurry. Whispers and rumblings from around the Parliament, including in some SNP corridors, conclude that it's to do with one singular thing, making sure the Scottish Government doesn't lose any more ministers. That is, quite simply, not an acceptable reason to rush legislation, and it is certainly should not be the reason we delay getting to the many other issues this country faces. Therefore, we are seeking to amend the programme to take the bill off the agenda for the rest of this year, and we should focus on the business that was sidelined and at the same time give the bill more time to take evidence from stakeholders who are being prevented from doing so. We will, however, support next week's business taking place, namely the budget, so we will support the business motion. But that does not rule out trying again next week to make sure the Scottish Government sees reason. And I urge the members to support my amendment today so that, does, that does not have to happen. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr Barnett. I now call on George Adam to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Mr. Thank you very much, President Officer. And here we go again. It's a wee bit like Groundhog Day in this place. Uh, but the proposed business uh, was discussed at Bureau, as all the business managers know. And the Bureau unanimously agreed the programme for business. And that included the Conservative Party business manager. Now, I know... I know the member is quite new to the Bureau, presiding officer, and I, I think he's learning on the job, so to speak. But when I look, when I look, when I look at the fact... Minister, Minister, would you resume your seat a second? I, could we listen to the Minister without the shouting, particularly from the, the, the front benches? It's up to the Minister whether he takes an intervention, OK? Minister. When I look at the fact that the position we're in here is it appears that the Tories' idea of the last week is to plan to shut the Parliament a week early yeah. to create a Tory MSP Christmas holiday yeah. uh, for everyone to do that instead of dealing with the hard issues that this Parliament has to deal with. And, presiding officer, I don't think for one minute the people of Scotland would appreciate this nonsense from the Conservative Party. On the actual issue at hand here, presiding officer, there's much talk from the opposition, uh, from the Tories, uh, about the fact that we have been trying to railroad this legislation through, to rush it through. The reality of the situation is that uh, the presiding officer, you'll be aware that uh, an extra week was given between stage two and stage three, yeah. because that was asked by one of the bureau, uh, the, one of the business managers, and I said we would work to do that as well. And not only that, this week there was also a request from the Labour Party, because of the debate on the issue, to actually have it for an, an extra hour which I quite happily agreed with members to do that. So when people have made reasonable requests, I have been able to work with colleagues to make sure that we can make this happen. But in all reality, presiding officer, I think the serious point here is the abuse by the Tory party and its attempts to close this parliament a week early before yeah, Christmas. Yeah. So I move the business. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 7120.1 in the name of Alexander Burnett, which seeks to amend Motion 7120 in the name of George Adam on setting out a business programme uh, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Uh, there will be a short suspension uh, to allow members to access the digital voting system. <laughs>